Good morning and welcome to this second of our value for data workshops. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, value for data workshops. Okay, so this is what we're what we're trying to do in this series is to take you from you know very elementary steps, hopefully all the way down to an advanced uh, state of knowledge on data ana analytics using uh, machine learning ideas. What Dorai and I are going to do today is to give you fairly introductory um, sessions. Okay, so Dorai is going to tell you about how to take data and manipulate it in Python. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about probability theory, okay? So which is really the fundamental of all these machine learning algorithms. So this is going to be trying to converge to a stage where you can finally take a real live data analysis example and analyze it and come out with some interesting answers. That state of knowledge will probably take five or six such sessions for you to reach. You may already have such state of knowledge. We're just assuming that you know we're just going to take you step by step to the place where you can do that. So this is going to be a first one hour session where Dura is going to explain Python, the language that we are going to be using for this workshop, and how you manipulate data, textual data in that in that workshop uh, in, in that language. Uh, there's going to be a half hour break. After that, so there's a small tea session arranged. We'll we'll tell you where upstairs. You can have tea and you know, sort of discuss Dura's talk. I'll then I'll start again for an about an hour, and I'll tell you a little bit about probability theory. And again, I'll give you some examples on how to manipulate probabilities in Python. Okay, So that will take us till about 12.30. There's lunch arranged just outside, as you saw in the Shamyan as you were coming in. We'll have lunch between 12.30 and 1.30. And uh, 1.30, we come back here. And you know there'll be a little bit more hands-on session combining both the work that Duray has done and the work that I hope to cover. Okay, So with that, let me hand you over to Duray. And he'll he'll take the things forward from here. Okay, good. You can all hear me. Everybody can see that stuff on top. I just increased the fonts, uh, so you'll see a lot of lines wrapping over later. I'll also do it with the editor so that whenever uh, you can't see, the last person can raise their hands. And that will also help if some of you can move to the front, where there are so many vacant seats. Um, so because you know, if you want to see everything, then that's probably one of those things that. You need to do. Um, all right. So, uh, good morning. Um, we're going to. Uh, if I had the choice of renaming the session again, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Viren is very particular, but um, I think please make sure that you mute your phones, which I think I need to do also, uh, or rather put it in vibrate mode or something. And when you get a phone call, please just walk out of the room, uh, just to respect others who are sitting inside. Um, trying to have this. So um, let me go back. This session is more like it's a one hour session. So it's more like a taste of Python rather than an introduction to Python. So if you know any other programming language, uh, Python will be something very, very easy for you to uh, know. In fact, I know that in this room there are a lot more Python experts than I am. I know I mostly do it, use it as a hobby uh, programming to small solve problems. So the code may not be as elegant as you expect, but the idea is more to kind of clarify concepts and basically give you some taste of the power of what you can do it for Python. I think we mentioned this in a, in a previous session, in the introductory session, but some of you were not there, so let me repeat. The reason we chose Python is that today, for data science related work, it is number one, choice number one. It Programming language R used to be number one. Not it's not programming language really, but you know, R used to be number one. But it's kind of a, Python recently overtook it for several reasons. If you want to build any data science applications, you need to do a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that you need to do is gather a lot of data. So discover sources of data, actually get the data. You know. Um, and this data may be in coming from spreadsheets, may be coming from web pages, may be coming from social media, and may be coming from a variety of formats that the government publishes in the, if it's in the case of public data. So it, there are large types of data, and, and you don't even know every one of the formats before. So you need a language that can pull this data, parse it, convert it to a format that you can easily process. And Python is one of the best languages for that. The other language, there is another language that is really good for it called Perl, but Perl is mostly re, uh, write only language. Um, you can write and you know you can't really read what others have written, but it's been one of the most 
successful languages for uh, you know web manipulation. Um, so Python is kind of more readable and fairly easy to use. Uh, today's the emphasis is a lot going to be a lot more, at least in my session, is going to be a lot more on um, how to get text, how to manipulate text, you know, how to parse text a little bit. Because as we go down and do other sessions, we're going to be dealing a lot with both numbers and text. And um, in the next session, we'll cover a little bit about uh, NumPy, which is a library in Python for numerical. I haven't used it a lot, so I, was, I didn't feel very comfortable talking about it. Um, so what I'll do is, instead of going through the language saying, oh, this is how the variables are, these are the statements, which is a kind of boring way to do it, we'll go through just rapidly with lots of examples. And as we go through each one of the examples, you will see some constructs. And then I'll try to point out these constructs, OK? You know, Python, if, if core of any programming language, you know, leaving the object-oriented part, essentially is assignment, comparison, loops, you know, control loops, and of course, infinite loops, um, you know, nested conditional statements, and then, you know, uh, transforming one data type to another data type, and then some basic data structures. In Python, there are lists, tuples, and dictionaries. Um, of course, strings, the basic data types like strings exist. So this is essentially what we're going to be playing around with. But there are some things that are really cool uh, about the way in which Python works. And whenever I can um, point that out, I'll point that out to you. Please raise your hand at any time. And if you don't understand something, stop because I think we need to get it at least whatever little we cover, we need to be fairly comfortable before we move on to the other things, right? So first, let me start out with a, with the standard um, Python um, prompt. Essentially, this is a, um, a interactive mode of Python. And there are a couple of other ways to do it. But I, I prefer the command line format. Light there? That light has to go, right? <coughs> We'll wait for that. Can you see it? OK. So this is the interactive mode. You can't really do a, uh, you can test out small things in it, and it's a good way to explain things. So I'll just use it for, for various things, like uh, you know the canonical example of almost every programming language is um, in Python, it's just a one-line statement. So there is no, you know, if you want to print something, you just say print and give the literal, uh, in this case, string literal. If you want to do something a little bit more fancy, you can do that. Uh, you can take, uh, for example, um, I can say a name equals uh, sorry huh, already my first thing like that right? okay so i can type a name okay and then i can simply say now i can uh, say print so that simple it's two lines of code. It can be made into one line. Essentially, get the input and then combines it. So the, there are three things that has been you know shown in this. How to get r input? Raw input. Basically, I'm getting a string without um, you know interpreting any part of the string. I'm concatenating two strings, which is one is a string literal, one is a variable, and then you got a new string, and then that is the greeting, and you're printing it out. So three different things being shown here. The nice thing about Python is the you don't, it's not strictly typed languages like C, C++. So you don't have to say int i equals 5 or something like that. So if you say i is equal to 5, um, and then I can print i, I can say um, if it's also, you have a feature called reflection where you can look at a variable and say, what type is it? And you can also query that. For example, if I can type type i, Sorry. Why? Okay. 
So I can take, I can overload a variable. Now I can make it uh, say 3.5 and then I can type um, again. So I just change the value of the variable to a different type. And so the reflection gives you the ability to look at a variable and then find out what type it is. And then you can use the type to make decisions. You know, you can say if type is in, do blah. If it is L, you know, else if it is something else, um, I'll still do this. Um, type string. Okay. So this. These are your basic variables, and we'll, we'll Python has a couple of things you need to watch out for, and you'll see it when we are we look at small programs. Is that Python is very picky about indentation; it has no curly braces. In fact, that's considered a big feature of Python. But initially, when you are getting into Python, this can be a major irritation because we so conditioned to type a curly brace um, and semicolons. And Python doesn't need any of those things, but it's very very picky about the indentation. So if you indent, don't exactly indent properly, um, it will crib and sometimes the program will do something very different than what it is. So that will take some getting used to when you're working with Python. The second thing which is more a Python 2.x specific feature is, um, I'll show it to you. Um, let's say um, using Python like a calculator, this will be unexpected. When you take a odd number and divide it by two, in, you, instead of getting a fraction, floating point number, you actually get um, another integer. And this, this throws a lot of people. I think they, they fixed it in Python 3.0. But one way to overcome this is to either do this, explicitly convert one of the types, in which case you'll get the proper answer, or you can also do like this. So these are two things that you have to watch out for. There may be uh, other smaller things. As we go along, you will notice. But this is, you know, this is very, very basic, right? Um, Python has some really um, cool uh, lists. Yeah. Yeah. I just noticed one thing that, uh, I mean, like you defined i as a this is a test, right? And you mm -hmm. use double quotes. You print i. You, you are not explicitly mentioning the statement print i, it, it gives it in quotes, right? This is a test, it is in quotes. But when you do it by print of hello and your input, then it doesn't give it in a quotes. Is there any difference? Yeah, so basically the, uh, the string, okay, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, say so we're mixing between the interpreter feature. Interpreter, you can just an inspect a variable. When you're inspecting a variable, it, it gives you that, that information. But we don't want those quotes in, you know, in formatting kind of thing, right? So typically the print statements will remove that and then uh, put it. But I'll, sh I'll quickly switch to some example programs that are written so that you'll, you'll not have this you know, confusion. So this is what is happening. In interpreter is just looking at it. And you know, yeah, you want to co comment on that? Yeah, just one, one more comment on this thing, because this is something that we uh, sort of stumbled over. There's another way of doing it. You say from future import division, that oh, overrides. Yeah, that Next overrides. One. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is that's another uh, nice thing is that I think uh, Python 2.7 onwards they they started doing it. They have started bringing some of the 3.0 features so that you can make the transition smoother kind of stuff. So there is a whole bunch of features that are there because here print I can say print space i, uh, but 3.0 you have to say print within is a, like a function. So you need to put it within parentheses kind of thing. So I don't, but I don't want to get a lot into 3.0 differences at this point in time because, one is because I don't know all of them, but more importantly because we, we chose 2.7 because all the libraries work um, in 2.7 and we have, they're not, not all of them have moved it to 3.0 yet or 3.x, whatever is the latest version of 3.x. I think it's 3.4 or something like that right now, okay? So uh, I'll define a list, uh, list is a pretty, um, you can you can have so this is typically different from the array in languages like c where you'll have only one type 
Here you can mix types. It's a list. List contains different variables. You can have uh, arrays of same type, arrays of different types, and that is completely allowed in Python. So that is that's something that uh, that you can do there. So I can slice the list. I can simply say, give me um, everything other than the first element. Um, this is like one of the really cool features of Python. I can say two, four. So it, this is called a slicing operator, which will you can take take a list and you can slice it. Okay, and you can do the usual things like append to a list, delete from a list, you know, all those kinds of things. And I'll show that using a program. So far, you're good. Any this is like very 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 basic. First couple of minutes, uh, Python stuff that you do. Um, I have a bunch of uh, programs here, so we'll go through some of them. Um, let me show you. So first I'll type, um, let me do this, it's slightly better. Can you see that, the last person, can you see the, should I increase the font or is this okay? It's okay? All right. Um, I can increase it slightly if you want. Um, so you have, this is just a simple program. Um, you know, this is a bunch of boole Boolean functions and pretty much very similar to lots of languages. It is a program that just, you know, takes a parameter, you know, like seven and minus one, seven in this particular case, and then does a whole bunch of comparison. So I can just run it and you'll see the results and I will keep the program right next. So let me, um, so it is seven and not s minus seven, so x is not equal to, a whole bunch of comparisons, equal to comparisons, less than y, you know, less than or equal to those kinds of things. And all of them exist. So all these are on GitHub. It's public. I'll give you the, um, so you can just take a look at it. There's intro one, intro two, two directories in which all these small, small programs. This is essentially what I use to um, uh, teach Python for beginners. Um, so let us start um, looking at, you know, if else is, It's a simple if then else, uh, but I kind of, um, so this is one of those things that I want to mention because I, I do it in a lot in my uh, programs. Um, Python has um, very powerful, really good modules. Um, Sys is a module and I'll, I'll, I'll get into the interactive mode and show you a little bit about Sys. Um, is it visible? Yeah. So. This is a module which can give you lots of um, really nifty um, utilities that you can use. Uh, and I use it a lot, mostly for getting command line arguments. And I'll show you that in, in a minute. So what you essentially you can do is, um, this essentially shows if then else statements. So you say if x is equal to zero, then return negative, else return positive. Similarly, if x modulo two you know, um, has a value, you know, return odd, otherwise return even. So it essentially, there are several things going on in this program, but I just, will, I'll just point out each one of them. Def is the way you define a function in Python. So you can say def, name of the function, uh, some parameters that you pass to the uh, function, and then, you know, function returns, you know, certain things, and some functions may not return anything else, okay? So we have two functions here. The second one that you see is the exception. So what uh, I do is, um, exceptions are essentially you have try, catch, uh, accept, finally, I mean try, accept, and finally, for example. Uh, so if there is an error, here what we are doing is, I'll, I'll just run this program so you'll get an idea. Uh, I'll say Python, if else, dot pi, five is odd and positive, it says. That happened because, um, let, me, let me run it again, and what I'm going to do is minus seven. Minus seven is odd and negative. So what I've done is in one case, I've given a command line parameter. Normally when I code it, if I look for a command line parameter and if it doesn't exist, it'll throw an exception saying index you know, out of range. Um, so what we are doing in this program is actually catching the exception and then setting some 
predefined value for variable x as 5, and then you know still calling the function and going through it. Can everybody make sense out of this? Do you want me to explain and think a little bit more? Fairly straightforward program. So the main, this is not the way it is written generally, uh, but I wrote, you know, uh, and there are some programs that are written the way they should be written in the sense that all this code that executes in the main body uh, should be separate and so that if, if any Python um, program you write can turn out to be also a module and there is a way of doing it and I'll, exp I'll show that to you in a minute. But here it's fairly simple. We defined, we imported sys which is a library. We defined two functions uh, using odd or even is one function positive or negative is another function. And then what we are trying to do is try to get the command line parameter. And if it doesn't exist, set the variable value to x. If the command line parameter is there, it's a string. I am converting it to an integer. So x is equal to int sys org v1. So the entire array of arguments is given in an ar array, in Python array. So it's very easy to manipulate for this. And I'll show you one program that does that. After that, it's a print. It's like a printf in C. Um, so essentially, you can say percentage D is, you know, like, so if when you look at them, um, there are all these parameters, and you, you know, you substitution happens. So percentage D maps to X. So you can say D is X plus odd or even returns a value saying a string, which is unusual, but for this example, you know, it's like that. Odd or even and positive or negative. So it is able to come and say 5 is odd or 5 is, you know, 6, like you can run it with, just to test it with something else. 8 is even and positive. So can you, right? If then else, you know, not multiple nesting, but simple if then else, try catch, say try um, accept, um, print, importing of a function, getting a command line parameter. Four different things happening in this program. Any questions? Okay. Let me do something. Yeah. There is no curly braces. So else has, uh, if you look at carefully, and that is one of those things, readability thing, else has a colon. Colon is the block delimiter in Python. So colon is equivalent to open curly brace and close, close curly brace. Indentation. That's why I said Python is very picky about indentation. So if you don't indent it properly, it doesn't know, it will execute the statement, you know. So first it will complain that else says nothing. So uh, we'll, we'll do some of those errors also. But everything is by indentation. So I thought we can see this. So one of the things that you may require a lot during our exercises is to generate random numbers. So I'll um, hope this is uh, a small one. Maybe this is better. So Python is a random module. So there are, you might have already seen in the previous one, I said import sys. In this, I say from random import star. There are some very nice um, separation, right? When you say import sys, it retains the sys namespace, okay? There are several um, effects of, the, you know, using one of these types of import statements. So when I can say from sys import star, every one of the modules, every one of the functions in that module becomes like local. There's, you know, you can, you can address them without a prefix of the module name. Whereas I said sys.org v, right, because I used sys as a prefix. So if you say import sys, you have to use that as a prefix for all the functions within that module, right? From sys import star, then you can use directly org v without you know, without really prefixing it. So that is one side effect. Second thing is that if you want only one function from a set, in a module has a set of functions, you want only one of the functions, you can explicitly import it by saying from this 
import this or import x, y, z, whatever. So the only those things are brought in and so if it's a huge module, you know, you, they don't all get loaded in memory and so it has got some, some benefits for this. So we are saying, you know, import random, okay, 10 random integers. So I'll run this program and it'll just print out some stuff. So if you do a random, random typically, um, from random import star I said, so that means um, random has become a local function, locally addressable function. So you can say random number always generates a number between zero to one. To make it an integer, I'm multiplying it by some value, right? And um, I'm, sorry, I'm just printing it out. Why do I multiply? Anyway, um, I'm, I'm printing out a bunch of values, right? But there are also very specific um, random functions that are available. So there is one called rand int, which will give you a range saying, I want between 30 and 50, and it will generate uh, integers between 30 and 50. So they have lots of control. It's a fairly powerful module. It's got lots of things. We'll start using it for generating l arrays of data and those kinds of things to test out uh, certain features. I don't know whether you're planning to, Ronja is here? Oh, he's there. Um, I don't Roja, are you planning to use uh, random or something like that for your examples? Yeah, yeah okay, good. So that, that'll be there in there. So I'll just run this. Um, so, 10 random integers, you know, and then 10 between 50 and 90, that is a very specific example. 10 random floating point numbers. Any questions? Okay, let me go back. So let's, um, no, exa no language is complete without the canonical example of a, a factorial and a Fibonacci series kind of stuff. So um, I'll, uh, I'll show you both. This is a recursion, right? Basically, we're defining a function. We've seen it's a function before. Uh, all we are passing it is a number. If the number is less than one, it just returns one. Otherwise, it returns, you know, n into factorial of that number. So it, it calls itself recursively, n minus one. And so it calls itself re uh, recursively and then uh, sends out a result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print a bunch of uh, mm, factorials. Fairly straightforward. No questions, right? So I'm going to now go a little faster after this, but I'll I'll also show you the other one. Another um, another recursive function. Fibonacci series. The series is fairly straightforward. I think it starts with zero, zero, one are the first two numbers. Then every number is the sum of the previous two numbers. Zero, one, one, two, three, five like that, it keeps going, right? So the fib is very simple. If it's n is equal to zero, return zero. n is equal to one, return one. And if it is anything else, return the previous, you know, two numbers in that sequence. And then we'll do it for a range. Um, so I'll just run this and then we'll So this is the series. Quickly gets bigger. Okay, it's the, at any number you look at it here except the first two or the sum of previous two numbers, right? Okay. So one of the uh, interesting things, and we talked about it uh, before. Any questions? So lists are kind of interesting in Python. They get used a lot. Uh, sometimes and, and lists can have lists in them, which complicates life. And lists can have multiple types of numbers in it. And these are all like very, very cool features because they, let, they give you a lot of flexibility. So here there is a simple list, fruits, a bunch of fruits, mango, banana, apple. 
okay then the next one is uh, vegetables you know so we can take a bunch of vegetables um, and then we can combine these like we can add one list to another list and you can iterate through this okay so I'll just run this and if we if you want we can make some changes to this also uh, normally I show something slightly different but anyway um, list of fruits list of fruits and vegetables so let us just play around with lists a little bit here um, even though I'm going to uh, so let us say veg equals okay uh, every one of them um, is a literal here but you can also have variables there okay same examples that I used here before, uh, but I, I want to show you one thing. Yeah. <coughs> Carrot, cabbage, banana, fruits. This I can say print veg. I don't have to say print, but you know, so you added two lists, but you'll notice something interesting, banana occurs twice, because it is both there in the fruits list as well as in the veg list. So I can do things like set veg. So it has removed one banana. Set is unique list. So it is it, it occurs in both fruits and vegetables and it has removed that kind of thing. So set is set operations are very cool in Python. Uh, and again, we'll be using them uh, quite a bit in, in our work. Uh, and they, they're like amazingly powerful. In fact, I'll show you some piece of code where, <coughs> I don't know whether we can do it during the session, but show you some piece of code where sets can like reduce the amount of code you write phenomenally, you know, like a small amount, to a much smaller amount. Fruits. So I can say, uh, you can say mango is a variable, it's called um, go or something. Go is equal to mango literal, and then you can put go in there. And it'll substitute. You want to see that? Okay. So I, I can, let's say um, F1 equals I can say L1 equals um, F1 comma apple. Mixing both of them, L1. The cool thing is something else. So which I'll, which is basically what I think that program I was trying to do. I can simply say new list equals. Okay, I can simply say which comma um, fruits, yeah. right? Um, you see, this is printed slightly differently than the previous one. It's a list of lists. This is a list of two lists, and you can keep on doing that list of list of list of list kind of thing. Uh, Python gives you no know, uh, because it's a f very very flexible. Some of the um, you know libraries which are like modules like NumPy and others, they give you special things where you can restrict and you can get back a lot of, you know, the efficiency kind of stuff because here everything is kind of by reference. They're all objects in some sense. And I've not used the wo O word yet. You know, we're, we're not going to talk about objects much in, okay, since I mentioned objects, let me mention this. One of the cool things about Python and it has become the first language to be taught in the top 19 universities in the US, Berkeley switched to Python. They used to te teach Scheme before. Stanford switched to Python. I think they also used to teach uh, language like Scheme. MIT switched to Python before, I think, everybody else. And a whole bunch of others have followed. They found that the biggest problem in programming, especially for disciplines that are other than computer science, computer science, anyway, they come there to learn about, you know, 
others mechanical electrical and all these guys they wanted to have a very easy to learn language but reasonably powerful and doesn't restrict you to do anything like if you go to java you have to think objects okay and lots of times we don't think objects naturally you know it doesn't come um, so python com combines imperative you know like typical procedural style programming a uh, bit of object oriented programming if you want to do you know you can create object classes and create objects and then do that and a lot of python modules use that fairly because they provide some good abstractions you can also do a little bit of functional programming which is all the people in lisp like for example it's not truly functional programming language but lots of good um, functional features are there in python so you can switch between um, some of these uh, modes and you are not restricted to using one in fact so far uh, what i have shown is completely procedural like imperative programming uh, techniques it's very easy to learn very easy to get into start writing a lot of code then start structuring some of your code as you know bring in classes and, and you can mix them completely you don't have the choice in a language like java for good reasons um, you know small talk was a pure object oriented language and they have their own benefits kind of thing but here it's for entry level people it's i think it's very very easy for them to do that okay so the other one is uh, next to list is um, one data type I, I don't think I'm going to really talk about tuples, but let me show you this called dictionaries. Dictionaries are known by other names in other languages. I think hash maps, associative arrays in PHP, hash maps in um, Java, right? Um, so essentially, they're ha hashed data, right? So you create a key and uh, create some value, and then you can create a hash based on the key and then you can randomly access it and you can do it very, very fast. For example, if I have a dictionary of 100,000 words and if I want to spell check something and I want to check against a dictionary every word, every word lookup is just like one, one quick hash, right? Or hash lookup, you just go there and you get it. So this dictionary, essentially the way you initialize a dictionary is curly braces. So there are curly braces in Python, but for different reasons. Um, so I'm going to take a line called you know, a, a string, then take a line and you can split it. So let me just get back into this mode a little bit. So I can say um, line, I can say line dot split. We'll take this line and break it into words. This split is by default using white space. There are other ways of handling it, but essentially this is what it does. So if you really look at it, if you look at type of line, it's a string. If you take type of line dot split, it's a list. So split takes a string, splits it into multiple words, and returns you a list, right? That's basically what I am doing in this um, program. So once you have this, so this for loop, you can use it to iterate through the words in a list, right? So I take this, this is a test or this is a, the quick brown jumped over lazy fox or whatever, and then you get these words and you re iterate over the words and for each word, what I'm going to do is, th what this program does is very simple. Calculates the length of the word, and then stores it in a dictionary. So every word and its length are stored in a dictionary, and then you print it out. That's all what this program does. But we can do it element by element if you want. We already have line. So we can say for word in line dot split. Okay. I can simply say print word comma length of word. So it's just taken, <laughs> taken a string, split it into words, taken each word, calculated the length of the word, and then just printed it out. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there. Well, yeah, so many of these are objects, right? And a string is an object, list is an object, dictionary is an object. So you can pass them in functions. We're not really come to that yet. You can pass functions in functions, for example. Um, so that is by reference. There is pointers 
in the obviously you know references are uh, pointers but it's not an explicit data type we use it in some very specific instances uh, but you don't manipulate pointers like in c language Ac actually after c++ people have taken out the notion of pointers java doesn't for example I, because manipulating them manipulating addresses has its own issues and so kind of people are trying to kind of move move away but the basic functionality of pointers exist there for this any questions about this okay so let me show you the um, so let me show you the example code so you know So you, you can see that the order in which the results are printed, dictionary does not preserve the order. So if you, is everybody okay? You're very silent, I'm a little worried. You're all doing okay? Okay, all right. Um, so what we are doing is, so let me walk through the code again. We initialize the dictionary, empty, it's called words, okay, a line is, a simple literal, you know, a string that we are given. Then what we do is line dot split splits the line into multiple words. Then for iterates over each word in the list of words that came back from line dot split. And then what I'm doing is when I say words dot word, I'm saying this is the dictionary. The index into the dictionary is the word. And what I'm storing against that particular entry is the length of the word. Okay, and then instead of length of the word, I could have stored slightly different uh, code. I could have stored the number of times the word occurs too. And we'll see that in another example. Then you can say, now I'm going to iterate through the dictionary, the next for loop for k in words, that is now we are iterating through the dictionary and I'm printing the k, which is the key value. And then I'm taking the words value, the key and a value pair is stored in the dictionary. And then I'm taking, retrieving the value of this particular key, k. And since that is an integer, I'm converting it to a string and printing it. And that's basically what is happening. Any, any particular order, I, uh, yeah. It's, you won't have any preservation of the order. It's, no, that's like a binary tree kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's a different data structure. The basic dictionary is a simple hash map. It takes the uh, key value, performs a hash on it, and finds some bucket, st uh, shows it in there, and then puts the value. The interesting thing about value, which, I which doesn't come out in this example. Yeah, sure. So we'll do that. Yeah. What? Of string is not necessary here, right? Yeah, I can put percentage D or, you know, uh, because I'm retrieving an integer, right? Yeah, in this particular case may not be, I don't know, we'll take it out and we can see. Um, so it's, well, I, so I, I was, huh? You have to convert it to a string, but you can also do like a printer formatting yeah, kind printer of stuff. Yeah. Percentage D and formatting. Formatting. We can use a formatting capability. But let me do this. We can. I'll show you another kind of sorting later. Um, you can simply say. Correct, so see there is, there is only one key. There's a key and a value. And you'll notice that a lot of these object relation, I mean the object databases are no SQL databases, they're all key value pairs. They'll give you one hash function, you take it, then you can retrieve. The thing that I didn't mention, and we may not be able to do it today, but we'll do it in a future Python section, is that value need not be an integer. It can be another string, and it can be another list, it can be another dictionary. 
see the python's power comes from the flexibility of where to use what kind of thing you can use something really complex and that itself can be a list, uh, that itself can be a dictionary so for example if you are thinking about a category hierarchy the like a three level categories you know you can have the top level category as the hash inner categories can all be in one that can be a dictionary so you can retrieve dictionary by dictionary is json uses something like that right essentially the json file format because they can be a set of nested um, categories you you will use there are like a bunch of nested dictionaries that is there so when when you get to json uh, probably during the next workshop we'll talk about this so i can print the sorted dictionary i just added to this i'm going to save it yes you got to run it this is because it's capital then everything else is a b c d k e f okay because i didn't case fold it when i was storing it i can do that i can case fold it as a key but keep the original value also so that way i think you can do case insens sensitive insensitive comparisons if you want am i putting you to sleep okay i think ronja is job is to come and wake you up um we have 10 minutes left so i want to show you a couple of things and i'll just show them to you and i won't step through this um so let's take this uh, thing called count words it's a fairly simple program okay i'll open a file i'll split i'll read line by line no in this case i'm just reading the entire file into one text i'm splitting it so that i get word by word okay so this is a simple program in fact this is number 3 that i give as a test to lot of programmers the first test is count the number of lines in a file second is count the number of words in a file and then there is a third one which is count the frequency of words how many times each word occurs kind of stuff here okay so it's fairly straight forward um so i need to supply a file to it so let me run this python um okay let us start with this uh, even though i showed you something entirely different uh let me see whether so i just randomly created a file called test.txt type this is one of the test files this is the second line this is the third line fourth line fifth line kind of thing you can keep on typing till you get bored this is the last line this is a period so i took this line and counted the lines right so let me um, go back and try to uh, do another one count words okay and it's like actually we can write this as one one line program okay yeah i wrote it like multiple lines so that it's you see all the steps that are going in there the power of python is such that this whole thing can be just one line um and that's something that we can try uh, during the labs kind of stuff because here all these verbs this contains so many lines and all i won't do any of those kinds of things you you getting the file opening the file actually it's two lines because i got to have import this but if you can freeze the file name you can do it as like like one line program okay so let me try to be a bit bold and try to type it sorry you can say mm, uh, open length of open open a file okay read the text split it okay and then count okay 
So you just call one function, change the functions one after the other. Next thing you just doing this. And there are even more elegant solutions than this, but this you can fairly understand. Sorry? So length basically, so what happens is, if you start looking at this, the open read split returns you a list. The length function in the list tells you how many items are there in the list. For example, we can do this, right? Instead of length, what I'm going to do is, let's, let me show you that this is type. So length of list, length of string. So it's kind of natural for doing that. Any questions? Okay. Let me close all these things. Um, the dictionary function, I have a variation which is very minor. Instead of taking in a string, I just essentially um, use it to, let me see what. Let me see what else I want to show you. Count lines, we saw count. C to F converts centigrade to Fahrenheit, and you can look it up. It's not, you know, Boolean we have already seen. Random number we have seen already. Um, uh, word count, sum of n, natural numbers, um, keywords. Let's see with the strings. Okay, let me show you this. It's called stris, sysog. Okay, so, um, So this is the program that takes the arguments that are passed in the command line and prints them out. So I can say A, B, C. So argument one is A, argument two is B, argument three is C. I can have a variation of this saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, five, sorry. So this is the way to get command line arguments that are more complicated operations possible, uh, yeah. You had a question? No, okay. So you can parse, um, you know, the because if you look at, you're coming from the Unix world, a lot of complex command line switches on off kind of things are there. You can say command line, you know, argument X is this, Y is this, and that kind of thing. So there is there are modules for parsing command line arguments much more efficiently, named arguments, and you can, you can use them too. So that is one, one, and then it's this is pretty handy. So you use it quite a bit. Um, okay. So let me uh, quickly run um, run through some others. Uh, I just copied some stuff before. I hope they all run. Okay. So, <coughs> so basically what, um, what I'm trying to show you here is the script one. Okay. So let me first show you the, um, uh, Web scraper so that so there are some good modules there of course pipe I mean a lot of power of Python for networking socket IO um, URL getting data from the web and all that uh, so there is in this we have three modules imported one is a regular expression module we'll talk about it a little bit um, there is a URL lib I think it's not current now people use something else. What is it, Faisal? You know? so, sorry? No, not two. Not your lib two. There is even something, requests or something. There is an, yeah. So that is basically what you use since, you know, this pro was written a long time back and I had it and I didn't want to go and start with a new one. So essentially you can start, you can open um, uh, like a, a file, you can open a website. You can read a page, then you can parse the page. There is this module called Beautiful Soup, um, you know, which will give you uh, lots of useful information. So what we are doing in this is, first let me run it, right? Um, Okay. 
print some bunch of stuff and just vanished. So essentially what it does is, okay, this is too big, so let's try something smaller. Um, Shameless self-promotion. Um, oops, what did I do? I need some data. So if you look at the program, so you URL lib, URL open, um, gives you a sysorg v1. I took the data from here. So again, the command line, I gave the URL. We test first tied with python.org, next we, we tied with value from data. So it took the URL from the command line, it opened it, okay? and then read the whole stuff, and that value went into HTML. So there is a variable called HTML called that contains all the HTML code that was there on the web page. Then you give it to beautiful soup, and essentially it parses it. And once it parses, it does some really simple things. You know, it gives you a handle, you know, which is called soup. Soup.title will give you the title of that web page, which is the first thing that is printed, title, value from data title. So you can, I did two versions of it. One is soup.title prints it along with the tags. Soup.title.string pr prints only what is inside the tag. So I just showed those two lines. The next one is, you know, all the anchor tags. So every link is nom normally has an anchor tag, a tag. And then the actual value, the link value is in href, which is one of the attributes of the anchor tag. So it finds all the, within the page, all the anchor tags, and then it, it gets the link from there, and then it prints the link. That's all what it does. For link in soup, find all A. So that, so think about this. Whenever you see for line X, you know, these kinds of things, soup, find all, or whatever, we are iterating through a list, and we are getting item by item, and then we are operating on the item. So I'm trying to get each anchor tag in that uh, HTML file. I'm retrieving that entire information. Then from there, I'm going and getting the href, which is basically the link value, the HTTP. So that's how you get all these things printed. Even speakers, blog about us, contact us, all the stuff that we have in this. And some of the stuff you don't actually see is all there in this, okay? So the finally, what we do is do the same find all for P. P is a tag for paragraphs. Um, and then you can go through the list of tags, and then you can, you know, that's basically what happens in the website. Of course, it's not readable, but you can further process it. So you look up beautiful soup module, and it's like the tutorial is really good. They got really uh, interesting ones. If at all, if you want to play around with an example, you want to actually get the links, all the links from my website. So what you can do is you can get all the links, store them in a dictionary or in a list, and then go through each one of them, find all the links in that page. So you can recursively go through this and get all of them. Just make sure that uh, you know you eliminate duplicates, and you know you you've just written a simple crawler in less than like 10, 20 lines of code, and it's fairly easy to to write once you have the stuff. Uh, let's go back. I just want to do one more, and then I'll yield control. Um, we already saw uh, split. Um, what I wanted to show you was, where am I, I'm, a, I'm in the school zone. Um, sorry. Okay, sorry. So I want to show you this thing called n-grams. So once you got a bunch of strings, we so far we have seen splitting them into words, so you get single terms. Sometimes you want to get multi-word terms, you know, which is like two word pairs of words, like two words, three words, four words kind of stuff. And here is um, a simple program that does that. 
I didn't write it. I copied it from the net just to tell you. Um, so what we are doing is we are just taking a file, which is you know passed as a command line argument. Um, this org v1 in that uh, test dot text is equal to load text. So load text simply opens the file and loads the text. Okay, into it returns the text, and then we the list actually is a split splits the text and then gives you the list of all the words, and then the next two uh, statements print list find the ngrams as a function, uh, which is there. It uses an inbuilt function called zip. Don't worry, I, it took me some time to figure out. I didn't even know about the zip function till yesterday. I was looking for some simple code to show it, and then I found this. So it's pretty cool. What it does is it takes multiple lists that you pass, and then takes each element of the list, combines them, and then gives you what is called a tuple. Um, and essentially, what this is what it does. So I'll, I'm just going to run it um, on. Was it taking a file or was it? Was it taking a file? Let me see. Was it? It was taking a file, right? Okay. So it takes, let me just type out. We can scroll back into this. So it takes this lines, line one dot text is the first line, second line, and th line. And then uh, what it does is it, it takes this, creates you bigrams, which is pairs of words. Okay. Um, it treats this as a word because in stripping, didn't strip the punctuation. This is E's first, first line, line this overlapping window kind of thing. It move, moved around. And this is pretty useful. Uh, to look at it, like for example, let's say I want to find out all the terms. Uh, we can even filter it further, and there are more sophisticated tools to do this. Like there's one called Natural Language Toolkit, which I think we'll cover in some some other ones. But essentially, and that there, it is just one statement, like n grams, and you pass the number of grams, and it will just return you the stuff. It's pretty useful. Like let's say I want to find out all the vocabulary of cloud terms. I go to a website which describes cloud, and, or data science for that matter. So I want to take all the terms that start with data or data science, and I want to find out all the things. Okay, uh, I can just go to the website. I can just read the contents. I did it from file here, but you could as well do it from this. You can pass it through Beautiful Sweep, extract the text. You can pass the text to this, and say, "Hey, find me all the terms that are related to data." So it'll say data, data, big data. If in this case. Uh, you should say that it should be in any any part of it, so you can find out big data, data science, data analyst, and all those kinds of terms will start coming out. So we use some technique very similar to this for finding out the skills in a job's resume or in in a job description kind of stuff. So it's it's pretty useful. Okay, all right. I think a like heavy overload. Um, I just wanted to see it's difficult for you to go through like, you know. Um, Python in, in such a short time, but at least you got a sample of a variety of things you can do. So I'll summarize very quickly. The data types are dynamic uh, in the sense that you don't have to predefine the data types. You can overload a variable with different data types, and you know you have reflection, so you can find out the data type of a variable. Uh, you have the usual strings and uh, integers and floats. You have uh, uh, very powerful data structures like lists. Lists can be nested. Lists can be within lists. Uh, then dictionary is an awesome because it's heavily used inside Python, um, and lots of modules use them. Uh, you have list dictionaries. I didn't show you tuples, but tuples are like list, but cannot be like expanded or you know cannot be they're um, immutable. Uh, you cannot change them. Uh, they have a good use for a long time. I was scratching my head, why do you need another data type? But it, it's got some good uses. Um, then we talked about modules, which is the way you import function in, into in, into Python programs. 
Uh, you can write really small functions. Of course, you have you know recursion, which most of the good languages have. Um, you can mix data types. You can have lists in dictionaries, dictionaries in lists. And so you're not like one type of data kind of stuff, So which gives you a lot of flexibility. So all these things add up to the immense power of a language for data manipulation. And ultimately, that's basically what I want to tell you. You can take any kind of data, and we not even covered some of the more powerful modules, like this one called CSV uh, uh, module, which gives you comma-separated values, or you know, you tab-separated values, and you can read them, write them. They're very powerful ones. There's a module called Scrapy, which can do all kinds of web scraping, um, which is very uh, very useful. So the best way to start with Python, there are different ways. Um, you know, uh, my first choice is if you already know some good programming language and you're fairly good in programming, I would go with something like Dive Into Python, uh, Mark Pilgrim's, one of the best books. If you want some really simple, no-brainer kind of startups, there is a book called uh, Learn Python the Hard Way. Actually, the funny thing is the hard way is the easy way. It's, a, it's got a, like a series of examples. Everyone is so small, but I find it a little boring because he'll make you do print like 10 times, and you know I get tired of when I see, I want to skip through fast. But if even if you have some basic Python, if you just go through the tutorial, learn a little bit, you can go into learn Python the hard way, go to exercise number, ch uh, chapter number 25 or 26, and it'll give you one big Python program with lots of mistakes. You keep on fixing the mistakes, and then, so one of the best ways to learn programming language is to make lots of mistakes or to fix lots, lots of mistakes, uh, both logical as well as syntax ones, and you start learning the thing. Really good um, data on, I mean, Stack Overflow has phenomenal answers to lots of good questions on Python. Um, there is a map function which I haven't shown. There is a transform function which I'm shown. There's some really, really cool stuff and very good for uh, string manipulation. Okay, with that, um, we are already like five minutes behind. Um, for the coffee break, we go outside and there is a, just make sure that you collect these like little tokens where is Rajesh? So he's out? Okay, so we have this because they have to know that you are uh, vi uh, visiting this workshop and so they don't charge you. Just make sure that you, it's like a small slip of paper you collect. Welcome back. Hope you had refreshed yourself with the tea and the coffee. Okay, so I'm Ranjoy. Um, for those of you who were here last time, you know me. Those of you who are not, I'm a faculty here. Um, and I'm going to tell you about probability theory. Okay, so what um, Dora was explaining was how to take data, load it into Python, and process it. Okay, what I'm going to tell you is the set of algorithms that you use once that data is loaded to find you know, what you're interested in, okay? So this probability theory is really the basic foundation for a lot of work that is being done in data science today, okay? And a lot of the alg algorithms that we use are essentially built on the foundation of probability theory. Now, some of you may already be familiar with probability theory, but the way I'm going to do it is slightly different because this is the way probability theory is used in data science. So probability theory is used in statistics, it's used in you know, logic, various kinds of things. Each of them has a slightly different approach to probability theory, okay? But the approach that we're going to employ here is the one that is most useful, okay? So at the end of my talk, or towards the end of my talk, I'll give you some examples from Python. So we have two repositories here. Um, this is, uh, if you just point your browser there, there there's a bunch of stuff, uh, including the scripts that I'll be using towards the end of my talk. And all my talks, both the talk from last time and this talk, are available on speaker deck, so you can look up the talks later. Okay, so that said, this is the outline of my talk. So what I want to do is, again, for, for those who were here last time, I said that one of the main things that you're trying to do is to try to reason under uncertainty. You have a lot of data. You do not necessarily know what are the processes that are generating that data. You do not necessarily know what it is that is the underlying model for the data, and you want to model all of those things, okay? And as you want to model that because you want to arrive at 
some conclusion, some reasoning. So, you know, so all of this, so as I said, what we're trying to do is data science. And if you're trying to do science, you have to be logical, you have to reason, and so on and so forth. And therefore, reasoning is really the basis of all of these things, okay? Now, as human beings, we're always doing reasoning, but the whole idea is to make machines try to reason, okay? So there are two broad categories of reasoning. So there is this reasoning under certainty and reasoning under uncertainty, which respectively are encoded, their mathematical formalisms are encoded in Boolean logic and probability theory. Okay, now you might be familiar with both of these things. Certainly, if you've got an engineering background, you would have seen some Boolean logic, you would have seen some you know, gates and how to manipulate with gates and so on and so forth. Probability theory, you may also have seen in various guises, but again, what we're trying to, what we're going to do here is to understand probability theory as an extension of logic, okay? So I'm going to put a little bit of background here and from then onwards, I will actually tell you what are these basic rules of probability theory, how you assign probabilities, and then how you put all of these together to do inference and learning, okay? So this is really going to be the thrust of my talk. Again, it's a lot of material to cover in an hour's time. Um, I will do part of it on the slides, part of it on the board. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me. And at the end of this, I will give you an example of, so this is a very simple example. It's just asking, I'm tossing a coin, is the coin fair or not fair? Okay, but this example illustrates more or less all the building blocks that you have in a typical data science application, okay? So you have data and you do something with it, you arrive at a conclusion, etc., and all of those things. So both this inference and learning aspect are very cleanly illustrated in this example, and this is the example that we'll be doing in Python, okay? So, as I said, so we're trying to do science, data science, that's the whole point, rather than data X or Y or Z. So if it's data science, you know, science has a certain kind of method, and that method really is that you, have, you observe something, you form a hypothesis about it, you know, based on your hypothesis, you again try and do some experiments, and finally after this sequence of things, you hopefully arrive at an understanding, okay? So this, this scientific method, this sequence of things, observation, hypothesis, experiment, theory, is done in, you know, the natural sciences, it's a well-developed sort of body of thought in physics, chemistry, biology, and so on and so forth. But because data science is such a new thing, you know, this, this thing is still not so well entrenched, okay? And one of the things I'm going to try and tell you to do is to look, when you're looking at data, try to look at it through this perspective. Try to look at it as a scientific experiment where you try to do some observation. So the observation would be the data collection part. So for instance, the kind of thing that uh, Dora was showing you, that you point your code to a web browse uh, to, to a web page it pulls in a lot of data so that is like the observation then you know you want you want to do something about that you you have a certain kind of data set you have a certain kind of hypothesis about the data set so you build a model for your data so for instance the n-gram model that um, Dora was explaining could be a very elementary model for your data that you have correlations between words then you know maybe that is insufficient then you go back and then you know sort of you sort of do this loop of hypothesis, experiment, hypothesis, experiment, till you arrive at an understanding. So you continuously refine your models and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of perspective that I, when I think about data, this is the kind of perspective that I bring in as, as someone who does science in another sphere of activity. And I would really encourage you to think of data science through this lens. So I'm going to begin with a fairly long quote. It's a long quote, but it's very important. Okay, so this is, I'll tell you who this person is, but let's just go through this quote. Okay, so what he's doing here is he's explaining what the scientific method is. So I've just given you this very uh, sort of one line explanation of what the scientific method is, and I want to flesh this out a little bit, okay? And this is particularly relevant because we're talking about data science. So he says that the peculiarity of the scientific method is that once it has become a habit of mind, that mind converts all facts whatsoever into science, okay? The field of science is unlimited. Every group of natural phenomena, every phase of social life, every stage of past or present development is material for science. The unit of all science consists alone in its method, not in its material. Now, this is a very important point. The point is that whether you're doing physics, whether you're doing chemistry, whether you're doing biology, or whether you're doing data science, it's not the material. You might be doing, you might be studying chemicals, you might be studying atoms, you might be studying organisms, or you might be studying data, okay? 
The point is not the material which is different. That is not what distinguishes science. What distinguishes, distinguishes science is how you approach that material. Okay? How do you study organisms? How do you study chemicals? How do you study data? Okay? So this is the unity of science is in its method and not in its material. Okay? And now what is this method? What is it that we are trying to do? Okay? Again, it's not the facts themselves which form science, but the method with, in which they are dealt with. Okay? This is really the kind of, you know, once, once you deal with facts in a particular kind of way, that is when you, you are dealing with those facts becomes scientific. And if you just look at these examples, you know, history of mankind, social statistics of our great cities, atmospheres of the most distant stars, you know, it covers a very wide range of fields of activity. Okay? So all of this, so when, when you're looking at data, you're just trying to do an extension of the kind of analysis that people have been doing for a long time. Okay, so now this, this person, who is this person? This person is Carl Pearson, he was a famous statistician. Uh, he wrote this book, The Grammar of Science. Uh, it's 1900, early 1900s. Okay? And this is an extre extremely influential book, both for scientific philosophy and for scientific methodology. Okay, so Pearson was a statistician. Uh, if you remember Pearson's rank correlation coefficient, etc., so on and so forth. He was a statistician, but you know, and therefore since he was a statistician, since he was looking at data through various you know, of data coming from various sources, he had a much more unified view of scientific, um, you know, scientific endeavor compared to, say, a person like a physicist who was only looking at one particular thing or a chemist who was looking at another particular thing. Okay, so this is 1900s. This idea that there is basically a certain kind of scientific method was developed greatly by this, another physicist, much later, so this book came out in 2003, uh, probability theory, the logic of science, okay? So here, this, this is telling you that this method, whatever this method is, is embodied most clearly in this body of knowledge called probability theory, okay? And it, this probability theory forms the basis for doing all logical work in science. Okay? So this is the point I want you to keep in mind, that when we are looking at this scientific method, you have to try and fit it in to probability theory. And what I'm going to try to tell you here in the rest of this talk is what exactly is probability theory and what exactly are the rules for manipulating probabilities. Okay. So the point is that we have to do logical reasoning. Okay, now logical reasoning comes in two kinds of varieties. One is either deductive reasoning or the other is inductive reasoning. Okay, so when you're doing deductive reasoning, you have a cause and you're trying to work out what its effects are. Okay, so it's implication. Given A, I want to find out what are the implications of A. It could be B, C, D, et cetera, okay? Given something, I want to find out what are the consequences. Okay, so the typical thing that happens, at least in physics, is that you have a physical law, you have, say, Newton's law, and you want to find out what are the implications of Newton's law, okay? In chemistry, you might have another, some, something like, you know, the law of mass action, which says, you know, atoms combine in a certain way, and you want to find out what is the rate at a which a chemical reaction happens, okay? So here, typically, you have, a, you have a certain kind of mechanism and you want to find out what are the conclusions, what are the outcomes of those mechanisms, okay? So this is doing deduction. Given A, what is B? Given A and B, what is C? So on and so forth, okay? And this, this whole thing is encoded in a logic called Boolean algebra. So this is the algebra that was invented by Boole, the person, and it, the Boolean is an adjective, okay? In another branch, you have this other kind of situation where you really don't know what the causes are, you can only see a certain number of effects or observations. And the question is, try to find out what are the possible causes. Okay, now this is typically the situation that you see in the space where you're doing data analytics. Okay? You see a certain kind of consumer behavior, but you don't know what the underlying consumer is doing. Right? You want to infer. Okay? You see a certain kind of financial transaction, you see a certain behavior in the stock market, but you don't know exactly what is causing the, that kind of behavior. You want to infer, okay? So the typical situation that we have in data analytics or in data science in general is that you are seeing a certain bunch of effects and a certain bunch of causes, and you're trying to understand what is the underlying reason for those effects that you're observing, okay? Now, clearly, if you want to do reasoning, if you want to do logical reasoning in this kind of situation, you cannot use this apparatus. This deductive apparatus is not meant for this kind of thing. The deducti deductive apparatus is meant for when you know the cause and you can work out all the outcomes. Here it's just the opposite. You can only see the outcomes and you want to work out what the causes are. Okay? 
the logical and mathematical formalism for doing this is called Bayesian probability. Okay? And that is why Bayesian probability is so important, or probability theory as logic, I've just introduced a new word, probability theory in this particular different, slightly different way of thinking of probability. This is the calculus for understanding or manipulating these kinds of situations. Okay? And that is why they are, they are the underlying fundamental mathematical formalism for all of these things. So this general enterprise here, where you have a bunch of data which you know, is showing you a certain number of effects or causes, and from there you're trying to infer, uh, sorry, certain number of effects, and you're trying to infer what the causes are. This general inversion is what is called machine learning. Okay? So in this case, you already know that you can implement Boolean logic in terms of gates. Right, and that's what we are always doing in the computer. You have zeros and ones. Okay? So the computer already knows how to reason deductively. Now this was done by, you know, as old as you know, Turing, Love, uh, you know, Ada Lovelace, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's very old. So we know how to make machines reason deductively. This whole thing that you hear all the time, you know, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, it is trying to figure out how to make machines reason inductively. Okay, so this is really the main difference. Okay? We already know how to do this. This is the basis for all of our you know, computing that we do right now. Everything is dealing with zeros and ones, true, false, etc. Right? But how do you make a machine reason inductively is really the outstanding problem. And there's been an enormous amount of theoretical progress in solving this, you know, solving this problem. And that theoretical progress is now feeding back into real life applications. And those applications are what you see as machine learning applications in business and so on, so on and so forth. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this thing. But before that, I just want to remind you of Boolean algebra. Okay. So what is Boolean algebra? Just in case, I mean, for, for those of you who have been doing engineering, of course, this requires no um, reminder. But for those of you who have not, so basically, this is a formalization of logic. Okay. And what you do here in this case, so just tell me if you can't see this at the back, is that you have proposition. Is this okay in the back? Yeah, okay, so you have proposition. Okay, so, so some logical proposition. Okay, this proposition in Boolean algebra has only two values. It's either true or it's false. which it's conventional to indicate by assigning it a numerical value. So true is 1 and false is 0. Okay? So you have these propositions which are either true and false. So any statement that you can make, it will either be a true statement or a false statement. Okay? Now what you do with these propositions is you do operations on them. So you do three kinds of operations, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. This basically means that you say and, or, and not. another proposition. Now a conjunction of these things is that A and B, today the sun will rise and I will be outdoors. A or B, today the sun will rise or I will be outdoors. And negation, A bar, today the sun will not rise, B bar, I will not be out outdoors. Okay? So I have these op operations that I can do. So a conjunction takes two propositions, a disjunction also takes two propositions, and a negation takes exactly one proposition. Okay? So with these things, you can now derive laws, okay, which are algebraic identities between compound propositions. Okay? So what you typically do in this case is to write down what is called a truth table, which says that given A, given B, what is the value of, let's say, A and B? So, so this is the truth value. So supposing A is false, B is false, then A and B is also false. Supposing A is true, B is false, then A and B is also, you can fill in all of these tables yourself, okay? And you can look at A and B, A or B, not A, and so on and so forth, okay? And now these give you the rules for manipulating propositions. 
So typically, you have a big compound proposition, and you want to manipulate it and figure out, given its constituent pieces, which may be true or false, is the compound thing true or false? Okay. Right. Now, what is a law? A law is an algebraic identity between compound propositions. So the most famous of these two I I I algebraic identities, for those of you, if you can recognize this, these are called De Morgan's laws. So the, one of the most important things is this, which says that what is, what is the truth value of A and B? So A happens and B happens, the complement of that. So that means A and B does not happen. Okay? This is what this statement is. A and B not. A and B does not happen. That is equal to A does not happen or B does not happen. Okay? This is one of the basic rules of manipulating propositions. Okay, not A and B is equal to not A or not B. Similarly, A or B does not happen. Not A or B is A does not happen and B does not happen. Okay? So these are De Morgan's laws. They're famous sort of, sort of important laws of, so Bull's book where, where, where he actually sort of uh, explained some of these things was called the laws of thought. Okay? And you can see that these algebraic laws or these Boolean laws are essentially equi equi equivalences between these two kinds of statements. Okay? And now what these do is they provide you rules for reasoning consistently with propositions. Okay? So if you have the truth value of a certain proposition, you can apply these rules systematically and arrive at the truth value of a compound proposition. Okay? So these are rules of logical manipulation okay? and therefore of reasoning. Okay. Now, what do you do when you have a situation where this condition is no longer true. So you do not have a situation where you have true, false, but also maybe. Okay. Now this is not something that Boolean algebra allows you to consider. There is no maybe in Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra is either true or false. Okay? But a real life situation, a lot of real life situations, out of the maybe kind. Okay? I have a I'm not feeling very well today. Maybe I have a cold. Okay? All of these kinds of situations that you can think of, I'm seeing a cricket match, maybe India is going to win. Okay? A lot of these things are always uncertain. And this whole idea of being in an uncertain situation basically means that this kind of algebra that is so useful for doing rigorous work in, say, mathematics is not so useful for doing real-life applications because real-life applications invariably involve a maybe-like situation. Okay. So what you need to do is you need to invent another set of rules which allow you to deal with maybe kind of situations. How do you deal with maybe kind of situations? And now the point is that you don't want these rules to be arbitrary because you see may, uncertainty is very is a very strange thing. You have a certain feeling about why you're not feeling well. You go to the doctor, the doctor tells you there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Okay? You're fine. Okay? So the doctor is also maybe making another maybe kind of assessment that, you know, yeah, you're okay. There's nothing particularly wrong with you. Maybe you're just, you know, feeling panicky that you're you feeling feverish or you've got a stomach upset or whatever and so on and so forth. Okay? So this maybe itself can be something which varies from all the way from certainty to falsehood. Okay? So this maybe is categorized by something called logical probability. Which is a number which we write as P and this is a number which varies between 0 and 1. Okay, this probability P is a measure of how certain I am about something or not. If I'm completely certain that it is true, sorry, it is false, then the probability is 0. If I'm completely certain that it's true, then the probability is 1. And for something in between, the probability will take some value like this. Okay? So this is this number. Which what now what is this number for? This is the number that I associate with a proposition. Okay? So today the sun will rise. If I say this, P of A, you know, any reasonable person will assign this probability 1. The sun will rise today, the probability of this is 1. Okay? But 
P of B, I will be outdoors. Okay, maybe if it rains, I may not be outdoors. Okay, so this would be a probability whose value is most likely to be less than one. Okay, for someone who is in jail, this is probably zero. He'll never be outdoors, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these numbers will be able to reflect your understanding of a particular situation. Okay, now the question is, just like I have these rules of Boolean algebra for manipulating such propositions, for dealing with the true and false situation. Are there similar rules for manipulating these probabilities when I have to deal with maybe-like situations? Okay? That is the entire question here. So Boolean algebra gives you a set of rules for manipulating propositions which are only true and false. What are the rules for manipulating situations which have this maybe component in them? Okay? These rules are essentially these rules of probability theory. Okay? And there are exactly, so just going back to, going back to uh, Boolean algebra, there, as I said, there are three operations, conjunction, disjunction, and or. Uh, so conjunction, disjunction, and negation. These three operations are not independent. Okay, so if you remember the fundamental gate, for those of you who have got electrical engineering or an engineering background, uh, do you remember what the fundamental gates are? So NAND and NOR, right? So that basically means that I don't need all three of these operations. I can choose any one of them. I can choose AND and NOT, or OR and NOT, as my fundamental operations. Okay, so these three operations are not independent. Only two of them are independent, and I can choose any two of them to be my basic operations. Okay. So similarly here, exploiting that rule, there are only two fundamental rules of probability theory. Just like there are two fundamental rules in Bayesian uh, in Boolean logic, there are two fundamental rules in probability theory, which says that this probability, this number that you assign to any proposition, whatever number you assign to that proposition the number that you must assign to its complement, its negation, must sum to 1. Okay? P of A and P of not A must be 1. Okay? Now this is exactly the same as this, which says that a proposition can either be true or it can be false. Here this is saying that if I know what, how much I believe in a certain kind of proposition, which is P of A, I have implicitly specified how much I do not believe in that proposition. Okay? So P of A and P of not A sum to 1. Okay? The probability I will be outdoors plus the probability I will not be outdoors must sum to 1. Okay? This is one of the fundamental base rules of probability theory and it's called the sum rule. There's one more rule. There are, and this is, so this is like de dealing with the not operation. There's one more rule which is like dealing with the and operation. Now, this operation says that the probability of A and B, the proposition A being true and the proposition B being true, is a product. It's a product of the proposition B being true times the pro pro uh, product times the probability of the proposition B being true given A. Pro what is the probability that A and B happen together? The, probabil the probability is that B happens and B happens conditioned on A. Okay? So, a has happened, what is the probability of B times what is the probability of B happening itself? And this is symmetric under A and B. It doesn't care. A and B is the same as whether I factorize it like this or whether I factorize it like this. Okay? This is the product rule and this corresponds to conjunction. Okay? A and B is conjunction and this is the conjunction rule. Now, as a consequence of these two rules and applying this identity, so you can just go back and see that not A and B is not A or not B. Okay? So, if I just take here A and B, probability of A and B and probability of not A, A and B must sum to 1. Okay? And then I just use this De Morgan identity here. It's okay. If, if this is getting a bit complicated, feel free to stop me or I, I can explain it more later. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you can, you can stop me. Stop me and uh, tell me what, 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 which, which part you've which part you've got lost? No, no, no. didn't get lost. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's going too, too, it's, it's going too fast. Too. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a question. Uh, e given a, sorry, a given b. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. So you see, with an example. Okay, very good. So this is, as I said, so we 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 need these rules, which are generalizing the Boolean algebra rules. Okay. So you want to know what is the probability of a and b. So here. There's an important concept of conditioning. Okay? 
This is what this bar indicates. So this bar indicates this. A bar means A bar means what is the probability of A happening conditioned on the fact that B has already happened. That means the truth value of B in this case is 1. B has happened. Okay? Given that, what is the condition, what is the probability of A? Okay, so for instance, what is the probability? For instance, What is the probability I will go outdoors given that it is raining? Okay? There will be a probability of me going outdoors. I might want to go outside. right? But if it's raining, this probability is going to get changed. I will probably not want to go outdoors and therefore the probability of this statement being true will now be reduced. Okay? So this conditioning is very important. When I know something is true, my action can be different depending on if I didn't know it was true. Okay? So this whole idea of conditioning is a very important thing. So if I now ask, what is the probability it is raining and I will go outdoors? I can factorize this thing. So probability outdoors, I'm just abbreviating these things, and raining is, you can now make it out from this. So probably, so now you have a choice of how you want to condition this. So this doesn't care about any cause or effect relationship. It just says, what is the probability that I out go outdoors and it is raining? Okay? So you can now write this as probability of going outdoors given it is raining times the probability that it is raining. Okay? Also, Sorry? Here? This is symmetric under, it doesn't care about. Uh, no, but oh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, absolutely, you're quite right. So this would be P of B given A into P of A and P of A given B to P of D. Okay, so there's a, there's a sort of mistake there. So this should be P of A and B, thank you for pointing that out, is P of A given B into P of B, or it's P of B given A into P of A. Yeah. Okay. So that there's a there's a typo there. Okay. So now you can see this. Okay. So that that goes exactly. So A let let's take A to be outdoors and B to be raining, and then we do this. Okay. So then the factorization that, that I'm doing here in this case is this one. P of A given B into P of B. Right? And this is the natural factorization to do in this kind of problem. Okay, so yeah, so this, this is a sort of fatal mistake and thanks, thanks for pointing it out. And you know, I, I'm so just used to seeing it, I didn't even spot the mistake. Okay, right, so. Um, so as I said, so this statement is a logical statement. It's A and B and you can factorize it in either way. When you actually take it to a real life application, it depends on what the question is. Are you interested in the probability of me going outdoors when it is raining? Then you factorize it like this. If you're interested in the probability of what is it, what is, when is it raining if I go outdoors, then you factorize it the other way around. Okay? So clearly in this problem, the more interesting question is to ask what is the probability that I go outdoors when it is raining? Okay? And then therefore I factorize it like this. Yeah. Can raining be only true or can be true or false in both cases? This doesn't care about the truth value of raining. Okay. Yeah, the, the convention is that when you condition like this, whatever is on the conditioning side is true. That is the convention. But it can also be false. It doesn't matter. Okay, because 
you can apply these rules a and not a, the relationship between a and not a, to turn this into a question between what is the probability that I go outdoors and it is not raining. Okay, and that is really the strength of these kinds of things. I can take any proposition and I can derive its logical complement or you know any other logical transformation of it just by consistently applying these rules. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so if I'm interested in what is the probability of going outdoors when it is not raining, I just apply these rules consistently and find out P of outdoors raining bar, P of <coughs> raining bar. Okay. So for instance, for this probability, P of raining and P of not raining must sum to one. So here I can immediately place this to be one minus P of raining. Okay. And similarly, I can do manipulations here and make that not raining. Okay. So now, so these, the, so the, the nice thing about probability theory is that they're just these three rules. There's nothing more. Okay, so whatever you can do with probability, you have to confine it to these three rules. Please note that there's a change there. Okay, so I have to fix that in my slides. Okay, so there is, there is, there is a change there. Okay, so now this rule derives from just applying, applying the De Morgan identity. Okay, so A and B not becomes, as you can see from here, this could be not A or not B, and then you apply that identity once more. So it's just an elementary exercise in manipulating probabilities, and you get this probability for A or B. So what is the probability for A or B? It's the probability that A happens, probability that B happens, minus the probability that A and B happens. Okay. So all of these things you might have seen as you know coming from Venn diagrams or so on and so forth, but you know their their validity is independent of a Venn diagram. Okay. These things don't depend on Venn diagrams; they actually depend on Boolean logic. So if these Boolean logical statements are true, then these statements of probability are also true. Okay, now given the structure, there are two important kind of events. One of these events are called independent events, where P of A given B is independent of B, so it's just P of A. So that means these two events are independent. The truth or falsity of B does not affect the probability of A. P of A given B is just P of A. It is independent of B. Okay? So if I tell you something has happened and you still give me the same probability for the original thing, that means those two things are logically independent. They don't care about each other. The other thing is when events are mutually exclusive, that means A and B can never happen together. The probability of A and B is strictly zero. A and B happening is false. Okay? So that is when under those conditions, probability of A or B is just the sum of probabilities of the individual part. Okay, So you have two very important kinds of events in probability theory. They are independent events and then mutually exclusive events. Okay, And ideally what you want to do is when you want to do a, a, a problem of analysis, you want to reduce all your problems into statements on propositions which are independent and hopefully mutually exclusive. Okay, That simplifies the analysis of the problem a lot. No, it means that supposing I did something which was completely independent of raining, okay? I have lunch. Now whether it's raining, I have lunch, whether it's not raining, I have lunch. Okay? Then if I say I will have lunch and it is raining, is independent of what is sitting here. Okay? Then the it is raining and I will have lunch are two logically independent events or two logically independent propositions. Okay? They, do, they don't depend on the conditioning. Okay. Also mutually exclusive. Which one? Both no, mutually no. Mutually exclusive depends on or. Okay. So independent has to do with and, A and B. Okay. A and B is if it's you know if it's A and B is just so in this case P of A and B will just be P of again I've made a mistake here so it's irritating. Wait, just let me fix this. Okay. So. Sorry, because it's going to. P of A, P of A. So let me write it in canonical form. So it's P of A given B into P of B, and P of P of B given A into P of A. Okay, good. Right. Yeah, so you see P, A, and B. If A is independent of B, then this is just P of A, right? So P of A and B is just the product of the probabilities. P of A and B is P of A into P of B, okay? That's when events are independent. 
events are mutually exclusive when p of a or b is p of a plus p of b. That means a or b can never happen together. Okay, that's that's where mutual exclusivity comes from. Okay, so remember that independence has to do with multiplication of probabilities. Exclusiveness has to do with summing probabilities. Okay, so these are really that's it. You know, so the remarkable thing about probability is that you can build up the most complicated machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. just repeatedly applying these rules. Okay, so that is really the beauty and elegance of of this whole exercise. Okay, so now so far, I haven't told you anything about how do you assign probabilities. How is it that you know? So here, this just seems to be a logical space where you know p can vary between any number between zero and one. How do you actually assign a probability? How do you actually say that you know this number is 0.1 or 0.5 or 0.9 or whatever? Okay. So in many cases, there is no sort of logical way of doing it. It's just a little bit of your gut feeling. Okay, what do you think? Okay, what do you what is your assessment of the probability? So you know, part of it is subjective as to how you assign probabilities. But there are certain situations where you can actually assign probabilities in a so before I go on, is there any question here? No, okay, fine. Yeah. In order for you to analyze any problem, you need to boil it down to these two uh what kind it's convenient if you can boil it down to this. It's convenient because then you know, of course you cannot. Lots of things are dependent, okay? And the whole idea is that you are trying to understand these dependencies. So a lot of problems, you cannot reduce them down to independent and mutually exclusive events. But if you can do it, then the analysis becomes very simplified, okay? So as far as possible, you should try to do it. So you should try to reduce your dependencies to the absolute core, okay? What are the absolute essential dependencies, okay? So that's in generally a problem of strategy, okay? So now coming back to this, how do you assign probabilities? So the way you assign probabilities at least for mutually exclusive and independent events is given by something called Laplace's rule, which says that if I have a set of mutually exclusive events, so if I have a set AI of propositions, I goes from one through capital N, so I have N propositions. And these propositions are all mutually exclusive. So P of A i given A j is just probability of A i itself. Okay. So these events are independent and they are mutually exclusive. P of A i or A j is P of A i plus P of So the typical example for this is the throw of a die. Okay, I have six faces. So the AIs are one, two, three, four, five, six. If, if the die is fair, what I get now doesn't depend on what I get in the next throw. So the throws are independent. So P of AI, AJ is just the probability of A. And AI and AJ can never happen together, right? So when I throw, I cannot get a one and a five together. Those are just completely mutually exclusive events, right? So then I have, I have P of AI. Okay, so under such conditions, the rule is that P of A i must be 1 by n. Okay, and this is called Laplace. Laplace is law. So it's what we think intuitively. That if I have a die which has six faces and I don't know anything about the die, then I should assign probability 1 by 6 to each of the outcomes. Okay, so this, this, is, this is a very useful and sort of intuitive Assign probability assignment rule, um, and it is used in many of these classifiers. So, for instance, when you do a naive Bayes classifier, the starting probability is always, you know, started out initialized with Laplace's rule. Okay. There is another method called maximum entropy, and you know, there is absolutely no way I can. I'm just going to mention this name. Okay. It's just, uh, it, it's sort of a half a course itself, you know, to, to explain where this formula comes from. Um, this basically says that if I don't have a situation which is like this, if I have dependencies amongst my events, then how do I assign probabilities? And the, the rule is that what you take is you take a function called the entropy, which is this function, P of AI log P of AI. And you sum this. Okay. 
So that is the entropy. This is called, it's given a name, S of P. Okay, so it depends on all the probabilities together. And what you do is you find out the distribution, the set of PIs which maximize this function. Okay, so this is called the maximum entropy method. Now, why why this is so, I will not be able to explain in this in this lecture, but it is a useful thing to know. And maybe in one of one of the future lectures when we do, do look at language models or something like that, we should be able to tell you a little bit about why why you do this. Okay. Yeah, it's related to all of those things. Okay, so this is exactly the Shannon information gain. Okay, and you sort of maximize this Shannon information gain, and you know that tells you what the probability assignment should be. Okay, but you know why that is the case requires a lot of background to understand. Okay, but just think of it as a rule at the moment. Okay, and the nice thing is that this this probability assignment, this maximum entropy method, reduces to Laplace's rule when these conditions are met. Okay, so it's actually a nice consistent thing. You have a more general theorem which reduces to the special case when the conditions are met. Okay, so now, yeah. Yeah. So for the continuous functions, you need to define, you know, a measure. Okay, because for for so, okay, that's going to take me a little afar from what what I've so far been just dealing with discrete discrete events, right? But okay, so the rule is yes, it does apply to continuous functions if you're a little careful about the measure. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So you need to have this to be true, right? So P of AI must sum to one. All the events must sum to one because they are exhaustive events, okay? When I have a continuous function, I must have something like P of X, D of X must integrate to one, okay? This is the normalization rule, the, the generalization of this rule to continuous functions, okay? Then you would expect for when I'm integrating from X min to X max, I must have P of X roughly 1 by X min minus X max, okay? This is the idea. So this is my domain over which the variable is defined. And, you know, the probability that it takes any value will be just uniformly distributed in that domain, okay? So this is a good point. What I, I, you know, I when I'm doing this coin tossing example, I'll come back to this, okay? Where I have a continuous variable. But it does apply even to continuous cases, okay? So now let me come back, so let me see how I'm doing for time. I'm not doing fantastically for time, but I think I'll be okay. Okay, so now putting all of these things together comes to the crux of the matter. That I have this probability which I thought of as extension of Boolean algebra. And now I want to come to this wonderful theorem called Bayes, Bayes theorem, which is, now let's see, have I got this right? Okay, at least on this slide it's right. It's not, <laughs> right. So this is this wonderful theorem called Bayes theorem, which takes this A and B proposition which you know is that, and it eliminates this thing. So P of A and B by the product rule is both P of A given B into P of B and P of B given A into P of A. So that means these two things are equal. So now I take this and write P of A given B is P of B given A into P of A divided by P of B, okay? So this is Bayes theorem, okay? So it looks like some trivial manipulation of, of you know, the probability product rule. Okay, what's the, what's the big gain that I get from doing this, okay? But this is really very deep, okay? It's an extremely important thing that you are allowed to switch this thing, okay? So just think of, so I'm gonna motivate this through a diagnosis example, and this is something where, you know, people have been, you know, human beings have been doing informal Bayes theorem for centuries, okay? When you go to a doctor and the doctor is trying to figure out what is wrong with you, okay? So what is, what is the typical situation? You go to the doctor with a bunch of symptoms, I have a headache, you know, my stomach ache, whatever, etc. Fever, blah, blah, blah. And you want the doctor to tell you what is wrong with you. Okay? So this is the typical situation. Right? I have a bunch of symptoms. These are given to me. I want to know what is wrong with me. And therefore, hopefully, I can take corrective action. I can take an appropriate medicine or so on and so forth. Okay? want to know this. But this is very complicated. Because why is this complicated? This is because the same set of symptoms can be produced by multiple diseases. I might have a headache because I've got a flu. I might have a headache because I've got something else. Okay, I really don't know. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symptoms that I have and the disease that I may have possibly had, right? So this is very difficult to work with. However, if I look at the problem from a different point of view, 
given that I know that I have a certain disease, what are the symptoms? Okay, I know that if I have flu, I will get, you know, I'll get fever. I might have a runny nose or whatever, and so on and so forth. Okay, if I have Alzheimer's, I will probably not get a runny nose, and I'll probably not get, you know, a fever. Okay, so given that I know what the disease is, the symptoms can be computed. Okay, and I can know this even empirically. I don't need to have some deep medical micro sort of, uh, you know, what shall I say, um, a sort of microbiological explanation for this. Okay, even from an empirical point of view, we know that if you have this disease. These are the symptoms, okay? And this is the basis for all kinds of diagnosis that has been going on, you know, in all, you know, pre-scientific cultures, you know, for thousands of years, okay? So given that I, what, given that I have a disease, I know what the symptoms are, okay? So I can do this empirically. I don't need to have a sort of microscopic explanation for this in terms of, you know, uh, biology, okay? So now see what, what, what this Bayes' theorem allows you to do. Given that I can know this easily, I can now apply Bayes' theorem to express this unknown quantity, the thing that I want, in terms of the thing that I can estimate. Okay? So P of disease given symptom by Bayes theorem is P of symptom given disease, P of disease divided by P of symptom. Okay? Now this quantity is what I can estimate easily. And therefore, this quantity is now what I can estimate. Okay? So this is in fact the basis of in the 1960s, these, these first sort of automatic diagnostic tools were invented in, in, in the US. Okay? They were essentially working on Bayes' theorem. Uh, they were fairly successful, and in certain cases, they could be even better than the medical practitioner. So you gave this software a bunch of symptoms. I have this, 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 this. The software would use Bayes' theorem. It would have a catalog of what are the symptoms you're likely to have if you have a certain disease. It would use Bayes' theorem, do the inversion, and tell you what is the probability that you have a certain disease. Okay? And in many cases, this thing could outperform, it couldn't outperform the best doctors, but it could outperform uh, many of the not so great doctors. Okay? So it would be more accurate than many of the not so great doctors. Okay? So now this thing has become very, very advanced. It's, you know, it's <coughs> developed into something very detailed. It's called Bayesian networks. But essentially, it's this idea. Okay, so the entire learning algorithms, etc., are based on basically this this theorem. Okay, this idea that you can invert. Okay, and you know this is sort of this is what is now called Bayesian networks. It's used for all sorts of machine learning tasks like classification, you know, clustering. It, it doesn't do regression particularly, but it can also do regression. Okay, so basically this is the idea again, sort of amplifying on what I said that you know you are these are the symptoms that you see. You have nausea, you're tired, you've got a headache. And it could be because of any one of these things. Okay, you don't know which one of these things it is actually because of. Okay? So what you therefore do is you assume, given that I have given that I have stress, what is the probability I have nausea? What is the probability I be I'm tired? What is the probability that I have a headache? Okay? So it seems that if you have stress, you don't have a headache at all, at least in this model. Okay? But if you have flu, then you have nausea and you know you have a headache. If you have a cold, you feel tired, you have a headache, if you have a concussion, you have a headache, you have nausea, and so on and so forth. Okay? So now we assign probabilities for each of these things. What is the probability of headache given concussion? What is the probability of headache given cold, etc.? Okay, and then you now want to invert and find out what is the probability of concussion given headache or tired or nausea or so on and so forth. Okay, and now you can see where all of this and and or business comes in. Okay, you might want to ask: a patient might come with you only with one symptom. I am feeling tired. Okay? Then you want to ask, what is the probability of any one of these things given tired? But the patient might come and say, I have nausea and I am feeling tired. Okay? So now I have an and, I have a conjunction. And then you want to ask, what is the probability of any of these things given nausea and tired? Okay? And that's where all of these probability manipulation rules will come in handy. Okay? So now this whole thing, I want to sort of summarize through this little acronym. Relax, yes, okay? So it's representation, inference, learning, and action, okay? This is typically what you have to do each time. You have to find a representation for the task that you have at hand, okay? You, this might be a medical domain problem, then you have to set up a situation like this. It might be a marketing domain problem, it might be some finance domain problem. In that, pro in that domain, you have to find out what are the important categories, okay? 
and you have to draw up a list of possible causal connections between those categories. Okay? This is your representation problem. After you've done the representation, then you want to do inference. Okay? So inference is essentially like the diagnosis kind of example, okay? where you are trying to infer a bunch of possible causes, seeing a bunch of surface effects. Okay? Now, often you will get this wrong. So for instance, it might turn out you've seen 20 patients, and you know that stress only causes nausea, and you are tired. Okay, but the 25th patient, you know by some other independent means that he is stressed or she is stressed, and you also find that there is headache. Okay, that means this representation model that you have built is not complete. Some link is missing in it. Okay, and then you have to add that link back, and this is the learning aspect of it. So you have your representation. As more and more data comes in, you see that your data is not consistent with the model that you have built, so you start modifying the model. Okay, and so this is the learning aspect. And finally, the end of all of this, what, you, what is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to use this to generate some action. Okay? You want to advise you know, maybe the marketing team of your company, or you want to advise somebody who's going to buy shares or something or something. So this whole thing, this final part, after all the maths and all of that is there, must be translated into something which is actionable. Something which is said in words, in plain words, saying that you know, if you do this, that is likely to happen. Okay, so this last part is very important. Often, you know, we get lost in the beautiful mathematics or you know the you know the beautiful graph theory and things like that and forget that you know this is really important. Okay, so this final part is really, really important. Okay, so what I'm going to do now with this background is to give you an example. This is a very simple example, but it really illustrates everything. Okay. So I'm going to ask, I have a coin, and I'm going to throw this coin several times. And I want you to tell me whether this coin is fair or not. So I'm going to show you the Python code and run the code, and then come back to analyzing the theory. Okay. So let's just quickly run this code. So Doreen has already told you about this, but this is really the full Python stack. Okay, so you have Python. Built on top of that is this thing called NumPy, which gives you an array class. Built in on top of these two things are a whole bunch of things for doing scientific work. So this is the IPython cell, shell. This is scientific Python, matplotlib for plotting graphs, SymPy for doing symbolic. And built on this stack are a lot of the sort of user-facing ap applications, like you know Pandas, which is gives you a data a data container, stats model, which does stats on it. There's the scikit learn, which is machine learning in Python, which is, you know, we should be doing a lot of this in future classes. PyTables, which is again like Pandas, it gives you a data table. And then there's networks for visualizing the kind of graphs that I showed you, like these association graphs, right? Disease, this thing, this thing, that thing. So that, that is for uh, visualizing graphs. If you're into image analysis, there's this scikit image. If you're doing scientific visualization, there's Maya V. And finally, I think somebody asked, and Dora specifically asked me to mention this, that Python is supposed to be slow, right? But you can really speed it up. You can make it almost as fast as C by using this thing called Cython. Okay, so you analyze your code, see which is the slowest part of your code, and you basically replace that part of your code by a Pythonic looking language, which is really underlying C. Okay? So Rajesh and Abru, who are sitting at the back, will tell you more about this in the, in the, in the part of the lunch. But this is really more or less the big stack of things that we're going to use. For this example that I'm going to show you right now, I will just need to use this. Okay, so I'm not using any of this stack. This stack we will use as we progress. Okay, so let's quickly look at this thing. So here's the code. What does this code do? Let me just show you an output of the code, and then we'll tell you what it does. Okay, so unfortunately, you can't see the whole thing, right? So let me, some fishy business with my laptop. OK, I'll show this to you part by part. So what is, what is going on here is a machine learning process. Machine learning process of coin tossing. So I'm tossing a coin. Data is coming in. 
and I'm asking what is the probability that this coin is fair. Okay. So this line here represents probability. As you can see, it goes between zero and one. Okay. And as you ask whether you know you can apply Laplace's rule to continuous variables or not. So this probability of the coin being fair. So when I toss a coin, it will land up heads with probability p, right? So if the coin is fair, this probability p is half. If it's completely biased in one direction, let's say in the direction of heads, the probability is one. So if probability is one, the coin will always show heads. If probability is zero, the coin will always show tails. And if probability is half, it will show tails and heads with equal probability. Okay. So I now want to ask, what is my best estimate for the fairness of the coin as the throws are coming in? Okay. So I throw once, I get a result. I ask you, what is the fairness of the coin? I throw twice, I get another result. Then I ask you, what is the fairness of the coin? And this I repeat, okay, with more and more and more and more throws. Okay, so if you remember your elementary definition of probability, that says the probability is probability of anything is basically the limiting value as n becomes very large, the number of successes by the number of trials. I don't have that luxury here. I cannot do an infinite number of trials. Okay, I can only do a finite number of trials, and I have to give you some estimate of what the probability is going to be. Okay. So I have here a situation where nothing has happened. No tosses have happened, nothing has come out. Okay, so the experiment has not even started. Under those conditions, it is reasonable for me to believe that the coin can be anything between completely biased to completely fair. Okay? No preference. So the probability is a constant value between 0 and 1. Okay. Then my first toss comes in. Can you, I think for those of can you see that? Yeah, okay. So my first toss comes in. I've tossed the coin once. So I've tossed the coin once. And heads has not come up. That means tails has come up. So the first toss of my coin, I've got tails. What can I say about the probability of the coin? Okay. I know for a fact, therefore, that this is not a coin which will only show heads, right? I know that for a fact. That means this probability which was finite at one, so probability one means that the coin is only going to show heads. Probability one immediately goes to zero with one toss of the coin because I now know that this coin will not show heads only because it has already shown a tail once, okay? So then it immediately goes to zero, okay? I go second time, yeah. Y axis is probability? No. Y axis is the probability that the coin is fair. Okay, so this fairness is a number between 0 and 1. So Y axis is the probability that the coin is fair, and X axis is the amount of fairness that you think it has. Okay, so you know for the, in this case that it cannot be a, a coin which is completely biased towards heads. Okay, and now, sorry? X axis is the fairness of the coin. So fairness of the coin means basically means that when I throw the coin, what is the probability that it will come up heads? Okay? So that is a number between 0 and 1. Also the probability is also a number between 0 and 1. So this is a slightly confusing example. So this is this is y axis is the probability that the fairness, yeah, that the fairness is between 0 and 1. So not all parameters go between 0 and 1. You know, there are other kinds of probabilities which you know this x axis will have a different number. Right. So now, then, you know, there are two tosses, one heads has come up. And now it looks like two tosses, one heads, basically means, that means one tail has come up, one head has come up, right? So because first toss, there was no heads. Second toss, one heads. That means I have one head, one tail. So now the probability looks nicely peaked around half, which is what you would expect intuitively. One head, one tail, I should have a probability half, okay? The probability, this says that the most likely value of the parameter is half. Now, three tosses, I get three heads. Sorry, three tosses, I get one heads. Okay, that means two tails, one heads. Now it starts moving towards this direction. Okay, because that means that it's more likely to be a coin which has a fairness which is tilted towards <coughs> the edge of tails. Okay, now I can keep on doing this, and as it goes on, as as the number of tosses increases, this probability, the shape of this probability distribution, will hopefully converge to a place which is consistent with whatever I have got. So. 
After 500 tosses, I've got 231 heads. And therefore, since I've got 231 heads, and I would expect 250, this looks like this may be a coin which is not wholly fair. Okay? So this is what happens as the learning proceeds. Okay? So now the question is, how, do, how, how are these graphs being generated? How did I do this? How, how is this done? Okay. So one interesting thing to see is that if you just remember this, just have a look at this, I can do this again and I'll get a different result. Okay, so I just did one more trial okay, of exactly the same thing. I just ran the code once again. Now you can see that it's looking quite different. Okay? So now I have tosses, no heads, tosses, two heads, instead of in the earlier graph I had one. And now you can see that out of 500 tosses, I've got 275 heads. And now the probability distribution has shifted in that direction. Okay? And I can keep on doing this. Hopefully there will be one trial in which I... No, so each time I do the trial, I'm doing 500 tosses, okay, and I'm counting the number of heads that have come up. So, uh, what is the y axis indicate for 500 tosses? Like, it's a probability. So, this is the probability that the fairness is this value. But y axis is the probability that it is fair, right? Y axis is the probability that the fairness has this value. Okay. Okay, so now you can see. Yeah. Yeah. So the more it, more the probability fits here, the more likely it is that the coin is completely fair. Okay. So you see, in 500 tosses on this trial, I got 245 heads. Right. So that's roughly 50-50. And now the probability distribution is peaking around 50. Actually, what, what you were asking. So the first one, the, the, the top is not around. It's not touching the, the bottom. Which one? The same interval would count as 5 and 2 heads. So the top is 5 and 2 heads. Five and two? Ah, okay. You're, you're saying why is it contracting? Yes. That's the whole point. That is the whole idea of learning. No, no, no. It's yeah. The then? The height, the peak. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm saying the same distribution between three, four, four, five, and two, right? This one? What, what do you mean, five and two? Yeah, first off, it's five. It's like again, point. No, 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 it's 40 percent, 50 percent. No, so I have got five. Here I did five tosses, and I got two heads. Because I, first of all that, and the point is that here I have much more data. So the more data I accumulate, the better my confidence is. Okay, that's the learning process. So remember I said that you know, as I get more and more information, my probability distribution should become better and better, sharper and sharper. So this is the learning process. Okay, so this says, so here it looks like the same. It looks like five by two is roughly 500 by 245, right? The ratios are not too different. but here, I have a whole regime of probability which I have not been able to rule out. Here, I have ruled out all of that probability space. Okay, so as more and more data comes in, my probability distribution gets sharper and sharper. And that is the value of more data. Okay, the more data I have, the more certain I have. So it might have, if I might have a situation where I have 500 and exactly 250 here. And it might have a situation where in four tosses I got two, two heads. Both those ratios are half. But my certainty here would be much less than my certainty here. Okay? For 500 by 250, is, 250 by 500 is also half, 2 by 4 is also half. But in terms of... No, so it's not really half. But I'm saying I can certainly do one trial here where I'll get, you know... Exactly. That is not equivalent statistically in terms of Bayesian probability to a situation where I have 250 heads in 500 trials. This has much more confidence in it. Okay? That's why the probability distribution is shrinking and it's also its peak is increasing. Because the probability has to be normalized to one. Okay? So if the area decreases, the height has to increase. Okay. So what is what is going on here? So this is this is a par paradigm of learning. Okay, this is exactly any algorithm which is claims to do learning will do all of these things. It will take some data and it will fold it in through this Bayes theorem and generate a probability distribution. And you're basically asked to tell from that probability distribution, you're basically asked you know, to derive some inference. Okay. So what is going on here? So this is the code. Let me quickly show you the code. It's a very short code. Most of the code is, you know, gone in plotting. Okay. So here, these first three statements are import statements, which import some of the important modules that I'll need. Okay. So this is the NumPy module, which has, you know, an array as a data set. 
This is the stats module, which will give me some distribution functions. And this is the matplotlib model, which I'm using for doing the plotting. Okay, so these are these three things. Okay, what am I doing here? I'm first saying that I will start this coin, whichever, whatever the coin is, I'm going to do how many throws am I going to do and what is the fairness of the coin? Okay, I'm going to set those things a priority. So I'm going to say I'm going to do this experiment 500 times with a coin which has a fairness of half. So I'm actually tossing a fair coin 500 times. Okay, what is the data? I want to generate this data. So data is stats, Bernoulli, RVS, P theta. So it looks like some very arcane expression. What this is doing is, it's just generating the data of coins throws. Okay, so let me just show you this in the terminal to make sense. If I just take this line and do it for a smaller number, I don't want to do it for such a huge number. Okay, so let's, um, okay, so I will do it for five. I is equal to let's say four, okay, six. Okay, so now what did I do? I said that I will generate this process, whatever is this coin tossing process, with six throws. Okay, and you can take a look at what data is. Data is exactly six numbers of zeros and ones. Okay, that means that this is one, one, one. Okay, so head, 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 tail, head, tail. Okay, if I do it with ten throws. data will be 10 such numbers, okay? It's not a random number generator. It is generating trials, it is generating outcomes depending on what is the fairness of the coin that I have set, okay? So here, because I've... In that case, wouldn't 10 throws, 10 throws have 5, let's say 5? No. That's the whole point. The whole point is probability is a limiting process, right? If you can see this here. It's only when I do one million throws will I expect half a million and half a million, okay? So that's the whole idea of games of chance. If I knew for certain that if I've thrown a, if I've got a tail now, I'll get a head next, there's no game of chance. Nothing is interesting, okay? So the whole point is that even though this is a fair coin, and I'm, being, I'm generating the thing from a fair process, you can see that I'll get a lot of, for small numbers of throws, I've got a lot of variability, okay? So here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight heads, sorry, eight tails in 10 throws, right? And that looks like a highly biased coin, okay? But it is not a biased coin, it is actually a fair coin, okay? But if I now do, if I now do, let's say, 100, and look at the data set, okay? I have a whole bunch of heads and tails, okay? But I can ask how many heads and how many heads are there, and that is here. So if I just look at this, if I look at the data, so this is this line. If I look at the data, all I have to do is take the data and sum it, right? And the sum will tell me how many heads there are because all the heads are ones, and there's nothing is nothing else is zero. So let's just do this exercise here and see how many how many data how many in this hundred throws, how much did I get? So if I just do data dot sum, so you see I've got forty nine. Okay, so in a hundred throws, I've got 49. Okay, if I do, let's say, a huge number, is that a million? Maybe a million, yes. Let's see data dot sum. Okay, it's pretty close to 500, half a million. Okay, so now this is, this, this is basically what's going to happen. But if I do only do five throws, or let's say again, let's go back to 10 throws, and again look at the data dot sum, that's four. Okay, let's do it again. Data dot sum, it's six, let's do it again. Three, okay. So I can get. So this looks look, looks looks like a biased coin. That you know, I'm getting in ten throws, I'm getting three heads. Okay, but it's not a biased coin. And the whole idea of Bayesian probability is to try and understand whether you know, if I were just doing naive probability, I would say, oh, okay, number of trials divided by number of successes is this, and this is inconsistent with my probability of half. So this is a biased coin. Okay, but Bayesian probability tells you that that is not really the whole story, and you actually have to look at the probability distribution itself. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just, just let's just check that. Okay. So if what what if I take this probability that I started with here, okay, which is 0.5, and I made it a crazy large number. Let's say I make it 0.9. Okay. 
Okay, so now you know for a fact that what is going to be generated is going to be a biased coin. Okay, let's just see what happens. So I'll just take this here, write it down there, and write generate some more. Okay, so I don't want to generate that much data. Not, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Size is ten. Okay, and let's just keep on doing the sum. And let's see how it goes. Okay, so that's eight. That's eight. That's ten. Okay, so I have ten throws, I've got ten. Okay. Again ten. Again ten. Okay, so you see a huge number of times now in all ten throws I'm getting ten heads. Okay, and that is because now, so if I now do this sufficient large number of times, whether this is go, whether the parameter is 0.9 or whether the parameter is 0.5 is something that I will be able to distinguish. Okay, if you give me sufficient amount of trials, and when this is going on, this thing that that you're seeing here, when this thing is going on, it's precisely that. Okay, for a small number of trials, I have a lot of uncertainty, but as I increase the number of trials, okay, so here is a nice one. Out of 500, I've got exactly 251. I have my probability peaking exactly at half. Okay, so okay, so let's just do that experiment. So let's take let's take this to point let's say nine. Okay, so I now I, I am now running a biased coin. Okay, I'll do the same. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll come to that. So now I do my experiment. Okay, and now let's see let's see let's see what the probability distribution is looking like. Okay, so the probability distribution is shifted all the way there. Okay, so now this is my inference. This is my inference about the problem. I know that the probability of it being here is zero. It has got zero probability of being at 0.5. Okay, and most of the probability is concentrated now between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Okay, so this is my statement. This is my inference. I now know for a fact that whatever coin is generating all of this cannot be a fair coin. Zero probability of it being a fair coin. Okay, or maybe some very tiny probability. You, know, maybe you can find out how much that probability is. Okay, but you can see how the probability distribution is changing. See, earlier it was moving towards the center. Now it's moving towards one side. Okay, so you can see this kind of getting top heavy. And this doesn't care about whether it's 0 0.9 or 0 0.1 or whatever. So you can actually. So we did that we want to estimate the parameter based on this. Exactly. So this is my estimate for the parameter. So I can now say that whatever is this fairness parameter has to be has to be concentrated between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Okay, so this is my interval. The probability of the parameter of the parameter being between a and b, whatever is the parameter theta, is less than is greater than a and less than b are the two intervals, is basically dictated by how much area there is under the curve. Okay, so this full area under the curve must be one. So how much area there is under the curve? So this is telling me that the parameter must be more or less confined to this region. Okay. And you can now do this, you can now do this for for the other case. So when the coin is heavily loaded in the other direction, so I can do point 0.1. And then you see it goes exactly in the opposite direction. Right? The probability shifts over to this side. Again, for small numbers of throws, I have a lot of uncertainty. But as the number of throws increases, I converge to the value that again I cannot so the point is I cannot say that it is point 0.1. I do not know that. But I can certainly say that it seems to lie between you know zero point five and one point five, okay, with a peak at around point one. So how you summarize this knowledge depends on the situation. You might say my best estimate for this is the peak. Whatever is the peak of the curve, which is the most probable value, is my best estimate for the parameter. You might say, no, I just want to give you a confidence bound. I want to say with probability one in one thousand or one in one million, I believe that the number is between these two limits. That is another way of stating your inference. Okay? Or you can say that I will just tell you what, what I think is the mean value of this parameter. That's another way of stating the inference. So these are all alternative ways of stating in a very small and succinct manner what is the outcome of this analysis. Okay? But if you want to, st if the question is, is this a fair coin or not, you can say with probability almost certainty, I know that this is not a fair coin. So okay? So, okay, so let's just, just, just look at, so if you now, so you can play around with the number. So this is where the size of the size of your data set becomes important. 
So supposing I did say 10, 10 throws, okay? And let's see what happens. Oh, and I put in a very bad coin. So let me just put in a fair coin. Okay, so let's just run this once again. Okay. So now I've only done 10 throws, okay? And what I got, I got four heads in 10 throws, and it's a fair coin, right? But you can see from this, I cannot say that it's a fair coin <coughs> because the peak is not at 0.5. The peak is at this thing. So all I can say about this coin is that it doesn't look like a coin which is between 0.8 and 1. It doesn't seem to have a fairness parameter which is so extreme, right? But it could be a coin which is biased anyway between 0.8 and 0.1, okay? And now you have to decide how you're going to, so you see that the point, the whole point of doing data analysis or data analytics or you know, data science is that there is no definite answer, okay? The, the statement that you're going to make will depend on your domain, on the kind of data that you have, and so here, if it's a question of life and death matter, whether you know the coin is fair or not, you really don't have an answer. You just have to take a call here. Okay? So if you if you say that you know if it's something critical, like you know, you're sending a rocket out to space or something like that, and you know, there's a component whose failure rate you want to estimate. And you are just not able to estimate the failure. So supposing you say the failure rate has to be greater than this, okay? And you're just not able to estimate from your data what the failure rate is. Now what are you going to do? You just don't have enough data to estimate the failure rate accurately. All you can say is some graph like this, which says, okay, it seems that the failure rate is like this. It's less than this much, by this much factor, okay? So these are very difficult situations. I mean, you know, there you, you know, probability theory itself is not going to give you an answer. Then you have to exercise your judgment, okay? As to, and you have to exercise your judgment with honesty and with fairness, and you know, whoever is taking the decision on, on, on the basis of this data, you have to be, yeah, so you have to say that this is this is this is where my inference ends. After this, it is a real life. Real life has to take over. My analysis will only give you something like this. Now, what decision you're going to take based on this will have to involve other non-mathematical, you know, criteria. Okay, so mathematics will not tell you what to do at this point in time. Okay. Should be one. Yeah. No, they're all normalized to one. All of the areas under the curve are one. Yeah. So I haven't given you the y-axis. The y-axis is actually changing. Yeah, the y-axis is changing. Yeah, the y-axis is changing. So it's becoming smaller, but the y-axis scale is also changing. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so that's I'm coming to that. N is not dependent on the function. N is what? The code. Yeah. So that's not dependent on the learning. Ah, no, it is in it is dependent indirectly. Yeah. It is coming from here. So it's just picking the first few numbers. Yeah, so let's let I'll just quickly go through the code. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm generating five hundred throws. Okay, as you can see here, I'm generating five hundred throws at this line. Okay. And then I'm setting up my parameter space for the for the fairness parameter. So that's a parameter which goes between 0 and 1, the fairness parameter. Now I'm saying I will look at the data after one, no throws, 1 throw, 2 throws, 3 throws, 5 throws, 8 throws, 16, 32, all the way up to the last throw. Okay? And now what I'm doing is at each time I'm sort, sort of setting up a for loop. Uh, so this enumerate will also give me the number of the, of the loop. Now it, at each of these throws, I'm finding out how many heads has been generated. And that parameter is actually entering into this thing. Okay, so n is these things. So the n itself is a dynamic quantity. Okay, so I'm generating 500 throws, but I'm not looking at the data all at once. I'm not looking at the data all 500 at once. I'm looking at the first first data, then the first 10 data sets, then the first whatever, and so, so on. But what I'm asking is yeah. uh, the function that you're using here. Only only here. Yeah, that function does not depend on it. It's it just picking the first n numbers. No, it says psi equal to n. So that that generates how many throws I'm going to make. Yeah, oh, it's, it just generates the number of throws. Yeah. So, so I'm saying I'm, I'm going to do 500 throws. I'm going to put all of that data together. But that, that, that generates 
generation logic does not depend on age. That's my point. The generation logic does not depend on age. Yeah, the generation logic only depends on theta, yeah. the fairness parameter, okay. right? So it just tells you. So, so, so this tells you what is the likely outcome of a throw, and this tells you how many throws I'm going to do, there, right? And then I'm sort of going. I'm, I'm I'm pretending as if the data is coming in one by one here in this loop. I'm pretending as if the data is coming in one by one. Okay, and then you know, and then basically I'm doing all of this stuff. But ideally okay. you should do that uh, manually. Not yes, ideally you should do it sequentially. For this problem, it doesn't matter whether you do it sequentially or together. It, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so ideally. This thing itself should be sitting inside the loop, and you should be generating the data one by one and augmenting the data. But I've just done it, done a little bit of shortcut. Without the theta and the uh, thingy for the without the uh, point phase. Uh, that you have to give. You have to give that parameter. That's the whole idea of the burn coin tossing process. No, 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 no. So the thing is that the idea is that this can be given by somebody else, and this I will do. So this data can be given by you. You can fix the value of 0.5. In fact, it's a nice experiment. You know, you can get, you can we can do it during the session. You can set the value of point whatever you want. Give us the data set. We will run it through this loop and tell you what is the most likely value of the parameter. Okay. So I'm not cheating here. I don't need to see. I'm in fact, you know, someone can go and I can turn back and I, I you can turn the turn the code on and you'll still see. It. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So the whole idea is that this, this I'm just putting here to generate the data set. So in one code, I'm both generating the data set and doing the inference. But ideally, these actually come from separate things. I mean, somebody else is giving you the data and then you're doing the inference. So when you are doing the inference, you don't know what the value of theta is. Okay. So this is just to do to you know sort of cross check. Exactly. That's precisely the point. That we are simulating here by being. That, that we are simulating here by already deciding what is the fairness of the coin. Okay? Those are completely random. Throws are just random. Random throws are just random tosses, which probably t, which probably depends on the parameter. Random tosses are random throws. Random tosses are random throws. Okay? So if random tosses are random throws, then you know that random throws are random tosses. Random tosses are random throws. 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 Random tosses Yeah, I'm saying that I will look at the data after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 16, 32, and 500 throws. This you can change to whatever you want. You can say this, this is when are you going to look at the data? Do you want to look at the data after lots of data has come in, or do you want to look at it as it's in, as the data is coming in? Okay? That sets that, that sets this so part the of the code. Can you can, yeah, exactly. It can be also be a sequence of increasing random numbers. So you can play around with that. So I just chose an array just to make it you know definite. And I chose it more densely at the beginning because that's when the probability is rapidly changing. Okay, so if you look at it at you know 200 and 500, it's more or less going to be the same. Okay, or if even if you do a million throws and you look at it at a million, so the real interesting part is when the probability is rapidly changing at the initial part of the throws. Okay, so I think you know since it's kind of so past lunch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so basically now, so I think this is this is the point I wanted to get to, and this is really the theory. And uh, I haven't got, got, got to that part. So this is the posterior. So let me just come back to my slides. It's, it's, we are well past lunch time, but I'll just quickly do this. So remember what the Bayesian inference algorithm is. It, it does this, right? So you have to sort of invert. So this is what this does. So what is, what is my, so let me just state the problem. The problem is I have data, which is throws of my coin, and I want to find out what this fairness parameter theta is. Is theta equal to half, or is it whatever? Given that I have got n1 heads in capital N throws, okay, this is this this is the question that I'm interested in. What is the fairness parameter given that I did n throws of the coin and I got n1 heads? Okay. Now what I do is I use Bayes' theorem to turn this around. If the parameter is theta, and I do n throws, I know how many heads I will get. This is just the Bernoulli distribution what you do in elementary probability theory. I throw a coin of fairness theta. <coughs> what is the probability of getting n1 heads in capital N throws? Okay, So that's n choose n1, theta to the power n1, 1 minus 2 to the power n minus n1. Okay, So 
this is the probability of getting n1 heads, this is the probability of getting n minus n1 tails, and there are n choose n1 ways of getting that, right? So it can be, so if I did, if I wanted to get three heads, sorry, let's say I wanted to get in three throws, I want, okay, so very quickly, supposing I want this. So this is also a nice example of doing elementary probability manipulations. So I want, what is the probability of head and head and, no, I want, I'm going to write this down differently. So I want probability of three heads in four throws. Okay, I want this probability. How many ways can this can how many ways can this happen? This can happen as head, 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 tail, head, 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 sorry? Yeah, so four C three ways. And how many is that? Four C three is four essentially, right? No. Six. Yeah, okay. So you have to do all of these copies. So this is complicated. Let's make it simple. Two heads in three throws. That'd be easy. Okay, so then what is this? What you enumerate all the possibilities? Head, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, head. Right? These are only three ways in which in this proposition can happen. Are these mutually exclusive? Yes? So only any one of these can happen. They cannot all happen, right? So therefore this must be P of head head T plus P of head T head plus P of T head head, right? Using the sum rule of probability that you know it's mutually exclusive, then I add. Are these independent? Is any one of this independent? Right? So if I get heads first, there's no correlation of head getting heads second and tail leg. So these are all independent. So then I can factorize each of these. This is P of head into P of head into P of tail. Right? By the product rule, plus P of head, P of tail, P of head. Again by the product rule, plus P of tail, P of head, P of head. Okay? Again by the product rule. And now what is this? This is theta, theta, 1 minus theta, plus theta, 1 minus theta, theta, plus 1 minus theta, 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 right? This elementary probability, what is the probability of getting P of head? I am calling theta, okay? And therefore, this is the probability, okay? So, okay? So that's exactly that formula. N factorial n1 n minus 1 theta to the power n1 1 minus theta to n minus n1 theta to the power n1 two heads in three throws theta square 1 minus theta 3 minus 2 1 and there are three such terms because n choose 3 choose 2 is 3 okay and there are three such terms so you know this that rule you can think of this as a straightforward derivation of the binomial distribution rule okay so what is this this is the probability of getting two heads in three throws so n1 is here two heads yeah so n1 is 2 capital n is 3 right yeah Bias has got to do with, so the, the correlation is not bias. Bias basically means that if I throw the coin once, there is more probability that I'll get heads than tails. That is bias. You can have a correlated coin as well. You know, the Las Vegas slot machines are correlated. So if you actually win a prize once, it will take a huge amount of time. They're sort of rigged in the inside that if you caught a thing once, it will not come out very soon again, okay? So that's a different thing. Correlation is a different thing from bias. Bias means that P of H not 
not equal to half. Okay? The probability of getting ahead is not half. There is actually more than half. So theta is not half. So theta is not half. Okay, and that is the whole question that we were trying to answer. Theta is not half. Okay. So now, okay, so very quickly. So this is my likelihood. So this is the probability of getting a particular kind of data if my hypothesis is true. So that is I know given theta. Now I have to turn this around because I don't know what theta is. I want to know what theta is given what my coin is. Okay. So to answer your question, this part someone else is generated and given to me. So I have now got this data from this process. And now I want to know what this is. So I, this is my task. So then I use Bayes theorem to turn all of this around. And then I have to put in this thing called the prior, okay, which is this part of the probability. This part of the probability. Okay. P of disease itself, okay, or P of this. So what is the probability of theta? Even before I have got any data, what do I think theta looks like? Okay. And here, this is, so there's some technology behind this. It's called a conjugate prior. And you know, there's some reason why. So we'll, we'll talk about this in the, in the discussion session, because you know, if I have to explain this, it's going to get pretty late. So just remind me to you know, discuss this uh, when we come back after lunch. It's called a conjugate prior. And once you combine these two things, so the, this, the posterior distribution is really a product of the likelihood and the prior. Okay, I have to take these two products. And then this object, theta to the power n plus alpha minus 1, 1 minus 2, is called the beta distribution. This object is called the beta distribution. And this is exactly so. This, remember the form. It's theta to the power heads plus a minus 1, 1 minus theta to the power tails b minus 1, where a and b are some parameters. OK, and just see what I've done here in the code. OK? So 1 plus heads. 1 plus n minus heads. Okay, so I've made a particular choice of these a and b parameters. Okay, and this is basically this beta PDF. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the beta PDF, the beta probability distribution function, which is the Bayesian estimate for theta. I'm evaluating it at theta between 0 and 1 for every value of the parameters that I'm getting, and then I'm just plotting. So the real code, the real sort of core of the algorithm is just this line and this line, or this, this bunch of lines. And all of this stuff is really about doing a little bit of fancy plotting. Okay? So that's really there is, that, that's all there is to it in this algorithm. So basically, it depends on what parameter. We, we need to know that TV is having A and B as X and one minus X. So basically, it's all about uh, so the math behind A and B. Exactly, it's a math behind A and B. Okay? So you have to do this math before you can write this code. You have to do this math and understand this math, okay? And then make a choice for A and B. So I'll explain why, why those choices are made, what choices are made, okay? You could do even the simplest, dead simplest thing of not making any choice here, just assuming it's flat, okay? Any value of theta is equally likely. That's also another choice you can make. But then, and then you have to code up all of this, okay? So you can see the math is very simple. But when you actually run the algorithm, it looks great fun. It looks almost magically like you know it has got a little bit of intelligence and you know, it can figure out what's going on in the coin. Yeah. So if you binomial has for a coin matrix. Yeah. So you could have choose like binomial or Poisson distribution or something. Why, why about your binomial? Oh, because coin tossing is a Bernoulli process. Okay. Yeah, you can choose any distribution you want, but coin tossing is a Bernoulli process. Okay. okay, it's a binomial process. Okay. If you were doing something else, some other, you know. I don't know, some other domain thing. Suppose you're looking at the number of phone calls that's coming in. Okay, and you want to know what is the duration of a phone call, of a certain phone call. That's modeled by a Poisson process. Okay? So then that you would use a Poisson process and not a binomial process. Okay? So what process you use will depend on what your data is going to be. But the algorithm is nonetheless exactly the same. So the only things that will change are how you generate the data and what this posterior probability is going to be. Those are the sort of dynamic parts of, of this algorithm. But otherwise, everything else is more or less the same. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Um, yeah. Why I chose? Hmm. Hmm. So okay. So. So. This. How I choose? How I choose the prior? Okay. So. This is the prior distribution. 
I want to know what is the prior distribution at which, okay, so this is the prior distribution. It, it has some form. You have to plot it and see what form it had. The average of this prior distribution is given by A by A plus B. Okay, that means this is a symmetric distribution. You can see that, you know, for, uh, it's sort of, okay. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the prior distribution I've chosen looks like this. Yes, I have assumed that it is more likely that the coin is fair than it is not fair, even before I've seen the data, okay? And that is because the mean of this distribution is at A by A plus B. So if you see that if I set A equal to one and B equal to one, this is exactly at half, okay? So the mean, of the, the mean and the mode of this distribution are all at half, okay? So if I choose parameters A equal to one, B equal to one, the, sorry, if I choose A equal to one, the, the peak is at half, okay? And therefore, before I have seen the data, I'm assuming that the coin is more likely to be fair than unfair, okay? But the point is that it doesn't matter. Once sufficient data comes in, my initial, this thing will get washed out. So what I choose here is going to be Im important when I have five throws, 10 throws, 20 throws. But when I have 500 throws, when I've accumulated 500 throws, what I've chosen here becomes irrelevant, okay? So A equal to one, B equal to one is the simplest choice, okay? But if you have very little data, then you have to be a bit more careful about what you choose. No, so this is just making a choice. I mean, do you think the coin is fair to begin with? Okay, and the conservative estimate is, okay, let me think the coin is fair to begin with because fairness is symmetric, okay? It doesn't tilt you to either direction. Whereas, you know, unfairness has to be asymmetric in one way. Okay, so this is just a sort of technical point, okay? With, so with that choice of A equal to one, B equal to one, you'll get exactly the formula that I've used in the final, final expression here, yeah, this formula. So what, I think this is a good place to stop because we're kind of running late and you guys will not get any food to eat if we persist beyond this. Uh, what we'll do is once we've had lunch, we'll come back and Dora and I will talk a little bit more about some maybe practical aspects. So for instance, maybe go through the rest of the code and see how to you know, get some more interesting information out. Maybe plot it differently or you know, just answer the question that you're asking. What is the, how much probability lies between two limits, okay? And so on, okay.